not turn it on. He's got a long stride. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 The 2018, December 18th meeting of the City Council of the City of Springfield, Illinois is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Oh, 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 <laughs> Alderman Santa. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Doing good, Santa. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's what I've tried to bring. A little cheer to everybody here. Uh, if you could state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> I think that earns you some cold. Santa Claus. <laughs> North Pole. Earth. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that good enough? That's, that's good. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Very good. Am I interrupting some important business? Not Always. tonight. <laughs> Always. Jeez, please. Well, for the most part, I've been doing this for a long, long time, Ralph. So you know, uh, oh, knows your name. nobody's ever never minded Santa Claus showing up anywhere. I don't. Maybe they gave you a. Lump of coal a long time ago, huh? <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> and we just got through a state election, and here we are getting ready for your guys' election. So <laughs> it's always election season here in Springfield, Illinois, it seems. So, um, Santa, if you're going to bring coal, can you give us a deal on the cost of transportation? <laughs> <laughs> Well, my sleigh Free only holds so much, but, you know, it, uh, we'll see what we can do. Well, that's a good thing, but anyway. Anyway, I've got, uh, like I said, I brought some cheer for everybody, and this year maybe I might be able to pull everything out of the box without uh, without dropping it all, but it's heavy. So That's good. Where's Chuck tonight? He's fixing a flat. So you better leave him a box. He'll be here. We better do that just in case. Could you leave it with me? I'll give it to him. Thank you, Santa. Thank you, Santa. I'm good. Thank you. Merry Christmas to you, too. How are you doing today? Pretty good, Santa. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How are you, Mr. Lesko? I'm doing well, Santa. How are you? Thank you. Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> we got something special for you. Oh, great. Oh, oh, thank that. you very much. Share that, Mayor. I must have been especially good this year. I think so. Well, that's debatable. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. How are you, Christmas? Fantastic. You ready for Christmas? Uh, absolutely. Okay, it's going to come. I know. Thank you, sir. Okay. You're still trying to figure out who I am. I'll tell you later, Joe. Thank you, Santa. Thank you, Santa. Thank you, Santa. Yes, sir. No lump of coal here. Right? Thank you. I appreciate it, Santa. That lump of coal can go over there to those guys. They can put it to good use. We got something to do. Treasure? Yes, there you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gerber, we got something. Oh, my okay, everybody ready for Christmas? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, I have it here. I got the pants here. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. Oh, so they can all work stuff. I'll throw these out here and you guys can all scramble. <laughs> <laughs>
That's a tough act to follow, but we'll do our best with the Inspector General, Roger Holmes. Are we going to take the roll first? Oh, yeah, roll call. Roll call. Alderman Redpath. Thank you. Alderman Senor. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderman Tylan. Here. Alderman Donlin. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, Corporation Council. Uh, the second year in a row I've given my fourth quarter report immediately after Santa. So <laughs> next year I'm going to come a week earlier. Uh, I will be very brief tonight. I know there's a lot before you. Uh, I have five items to report, uh, and you have four written reports there. I threw my dear secretary a curve late in the afternoon, and one of them didn't make it into the packet, but I'll get it to Mr. Griffin to circulate to you and, and to the city clerk. Uh, Inspector General Report 2018 OIG 3 uh, is a complainant who is a concern that the city has a conspiracy against him and is directing all of its attention to only him uh, with regard to ordinance violations and circuit court actions. Uh, he has been involved in that capacity with the city for a number of years. Uh, and. Uh, the things he was complaining about in administrative law court date back five years or so, uh, and uh, the circuit court cases are slightly newer. Uh, I note that an administrative law decision has to be appealed within 35 days to the circuit court, uh, and then the city brought some demolition cases against him, uh, and uh, the rulings that went against him had to be appealed within 30 days. Complainant has never filed an appeal in a couple of cases in circuit court. Uh, he was defaulted, which gives him two years, and he uh, acknowledged that he was aware of the default within the two years and took no action. So there really was nothing to do for him other than to tell them that I've concluded that he is not the subject of a conspiracy and that the city is uh, using its resources to bring cases against uh, many people who are violating ordinances. So no further action will be taken on that case. Um, OIG uh, 8 is a rather lengthy uh, number of issues raised by a CWOP non-union, non-FLSA employee. Uh, the most significant issue raised by that complainant uh, is the issue of compensatory time for overtime on salaried workers. And uh, I received clarification uh, from CWLP about their pre procedures and policies. Uh, his, the complainant felt that uh, because the city is short-staffed, he could not utilize any compensatory time and still get his work done. He was a very dedicated employee. Uh, but uh, my investigation disclosed that after 75 hours of comp time that he could apply for straight time wages for overtime. Being FLSA exempt, he would not get time and a half or double time. Uh, and that 75 hours stays with the employee until retirement or termination and then it is bought back. So it ultimately that time will be compensated and uh, I have encouraged that person to pursue uh, seeking monetary pay after the 75 comp time hours. Uh, he raised a second question, uh, concerned that he was going to be forced to hire a, the husband of a niece of the mayor. As it turns out, that person was an applicant, that person was unsuccessful, and that person chose to leave city employment. So. I find that to be a non-issue. Uh, next, he raises the issue that three and a half years ago, the mayor appointed his sister, Julia Frevert, as uh, communication director. That uh, issue has been looked at and beat to death. Uh, the mayor issued an executive order at the time of the appointment uh, so that uh, 
The communications director does not report to the mayor. Uh, the city council was fully aware and approved it. Uh, and I read several newspaper articles uh, praising the communications director for her service. So again, I think that has been looked at uh, ad nauseum and I will take no further action. Uh, complainant's next issue is persons being given temporary assignments uh, at CWLP well, working up or they call it acting up, uh, not in the bad way, but working at a higher pay grade uh, to fill in for a vacancy or to fill in for someone who is on leave uh, by action of this council, uh, there is a delay in hiring. So yes, there are times when that has to occur. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this did not happen to the complainant. Uh, complainant went to great lengths to remain anonymous and said that he's heard other people have this complaint without being able to speak to the other people. It's very difficult to flesh that out. Uh, other than uh, that I learned that the procedure is that a department director can request from HR uh, that the pay grade be increased during the temporary assignment. Of course, this has no bearing on union cases, which automatically have provisions for that to occur. So there being no opportunity to speak specifically to a person, uh, there's no further examination of that issue. Uh, next, complainant alleges that a retired city employee who was receiving an IMRF pension has been hired back, and that's not allowed under the code. Uh, in fact, the person who was hired back immediately uh, had his, <coughs> by law, had his IMRF pension ceased. So there is no issue there. That was a case of misinformation. Um, and additionally, complainant alleged a particular person was hired above the mid-grade salary for a position, and it's the city uh, code that you are hired uh, at an amount not to exceed the mid-grade of the position. Person was hired $1,640 below the midpoint <coughs> and continues to work below the midpoint. Uh, next, complainant gave a list of four names individuals that he claims had some family or political connection to uh, city government. Two of the four were short-term employees who've left city employment and the claimed connections to the mayor were at most tenuous. A third described as a frequent critic of the mayor who's now quiet was a temporary hire out of a union hall. The city has no ability to specify who gets hired out of the union hall. And the third person who is a relative of the mayor has been a city employee <coughs> for 30 years prior to this mayor taking office. So I find no issue there. Um, so uh, a final note in that report is that I've spoken at length with the city HR director who says that at no point has he ever been asked by the mayor or anyone in administration to hire a particular person or to influence any hiring decision? So this case is closed. All right. Uh, OIG 11, I was contacted by a CWLP employee who was a second year apprentice at the power plant, alleging that he had been verbally and physically confronted uh, in May of this year. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm on day 18 of a cold. Should be ending soon. Uh, I had two in-person interviews with the complainant. Uh, I interviewed five people at the power plant. I had great cooperation from CWOP to conduct those interviews and to uh, be inside the plant to investigate the location where the alleged incident occurred. Uh, in short, there was a dispute over uh, the work done by the complainant, uh, which is alleged to have caused a great deal of uh, work <coughs> for the alleged aggressor, who admits that he engaged in a profanity-laced tirade against the younger employee. Uh, there's dispute as to how it became physical. 
It was physical only in the nature of a chest bump. Uh, who bumped who first is really difficult to determine. Uh, the room is very small, the break room. Uh, <coughs> both parties agree that the complainant pushed the alleged aggressor away from him, and the alleged aggressor admits that he said something to the effect, if you touch me again, I will choke the life out of you. Uh, complainant is alleging a hostile workplace, but quite out of context, the complainant's response was, that would be the best thing you could do for me. Uh, I found that complainant had applied for 21 uh, in his two years, 21 positions, trying to get away from shift work. Uh, thereafter, also the complainant picked up a, an intercom, <coughs> which paged throughout CWLP, asking for the alleged aggressor to come back. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, then <coughs> uh, later, uh, Later, I met with complainant and HR as the complainant, oh, in, in the interim period, complainant resigned from the city, stating a hostile workplace. Uh, and then I met with complainant and HR, where he was asking to be reinstated to his old position, working again with, thank you, working again with the alleged aggressor, uh, which to me, leads to the conclusion that this was not a hostile workplace. Uh, when HR completed its review, a very thorough review, it recommended a written reprimand to each person. Um, of course, by that point, complainant was no longer with the city. <coughs> the final report you have in front of you is 2018 OIG 15. Uh, a uh, complainant came to me. Uh, alleging that he was a CWLP meter reader who was a probationary employee and that the three weeks or so short of his uh, probationary employment, he was summarily terminated and given a reason for his termination, uh, an allegation that he alleged in curbing, uh, which is an act where a meter reader might put in false uh, information rather than read the meter. Uh, the complainant strongly denied that he engaged in that activity, uh, but uh, the, uh, and that was explained to him by his supervisor at CWLP, uh, and there is no review available to a probationary employee. It states that on the termination form, it was signed off by uh, all appropriate parties. Uh, so there really is no recourse for this person. But my recommendation is if someone is terminating a probationary employee, which can be done summarily, uh, then <coughs> if you give a reason, you're opening the door for that person to contest why they're being terminated when they really have no opportunity to contest that termination. So my recommendation would be uh, they should not be given any reason because the code provides that they can be terminated without a reason. Uh, the one report, a very brief, uh, that I don't have with you in writing tonight uh, is that a complainant came forward alleging that a city employee had sent him some, what I saw would be adult holiday humor on a couple of occasions. This was a friend of the person. Uh, the complainant said that he'd lent money to that person and was having trouble getting it paid back. There was nothing threatening in the emails. His allegation was they were sent on company time. That didn't seem to bear out, but more significantly, uh, the complainant is uh, no longer in a position to communicate with me, so I'm closing that investigation. Should complainant come forward in the future, I will reopen. And uh, that concludes my five reports for the evening. Are there any questions? Any questions? Good job, Jeff. 
All right, thank you, you all, much. and Merry Christmas. I don't have gifts to give you, but that would probably be a violation I would need to investigate myself. So uh, we, will, we will leave it at that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Appreciate your good work. Going into the zoning portion of our meeting, the first item on the agenda is docket number 2018-058 for the property located at 2715 Old Ash Street, parcel one and 2721 Old Ash Street and 2725 Old Ash Street, Parcel 2. Petitioner is Roger and Janet Eddington as owners of Parcel 1 and Kathleen Hanley as executor of the estate of Jocelyn DeFrades as owner of Parcel 2. Present zoning classification is R1, single family residence district, section 155.016. Requested zoning relief reclassification to I1, light industrial district, section 155.040. Springfield Sangman County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is denial of reclassification to I1, suggests reclassification classification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is denied, petition as submitted, and instead grant reclassification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034. Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, accept the staff recommendation for B2 to exclude the following uses, gunsmiths repairs, poultry and rabbit killing, tire recapping and repairing, public transit yards, Railroad freight or passenger stations and facilities or services used or required in railroad operations, ambulance services, electric substations, detention facilities, adult or juvenile, gas valve and repair sites, fire station, outdoor corn, telephone and booths, police stations, post office, central or branch, telephone exchanges, and to conclude, water or sewer pumping stations. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept staff recommendation and as read into the record, excluding the exceptions. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion to amend? Do the amendment first, Council? Or just so vote just, it all just at off, once? Just to adopt, you may vote on the adopt as amended. It includes the exceptions. Okay. Yeah. So uh, passing the zoning as amended. <clears throat> And it passes eight voting yes, or nine voting yes, none voting no. And if you could turn those into the clerk, if the clerk does not have I'd those. Happy Thank, you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-064 for the property located at 27 Hedge Drive. Petitioner is Rocky L. Barfield. Present zoning classification is R2, single family and duplex residence district 155.017. Requested zoning relief, a variance of section 155.061, basic yard requirements and section 155.068, garages or accessory buildings and structures to construct in addition to the existing garage with an approximate nine foot front yard setback and a family room addition with approximately 17 foot front yard setback instead of the required 25 foot setback required per code and to allow an existing six foot by 12 foot shed located in a required side yard lot setback and an approximate zero foot setback from the house instead of the six feet per code and an approximate zero foot setback from the south property line instead of the three feet required. Springfield Sangman County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is denial. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of Springfield Sangman County Regional Planning and deny the petition as submitted. Chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the petition as, sub as submitted by the petitioner. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the petition as submitted and seconded. Any discussion? Anybody from the audience wish to address the issue? Is there, uh, so those voting for the approval, vote yes. Those against, vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-065 for the property located at 3335 East Enos. Petitioner is Sydney Letts. Present zoning classification is R1, single family residence, district section 155.015. Requested zoning relief reclassification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034, and a variance of Section 155.034, B2, General Business Service District, to allow a single family residence and Section 155.001 definitions lot to allow two principal uses on a lot. 
the existing single family home and the existing gunsmith shop and section 155.111, access to off street parking facilities to allow the drive leading to the parking for the shop is approximately 19 feet wide instead of the 24, required 24 foot width for two direction flow of traffic and section 155.320 CD and E permitted accessory on premises signs to allow the existing sign to remain approximately four foot by four foot within 10 feet of the street right of way and not 10 feet above grade and located approximately 43 feet from the residential zoning district to the east instead of the required 50 feet. And the base of the sign does not have to have a five foot diameter ground cover per code. In the alternative, petitioner requests a use variance in the R1 district to allow continued operation of the gunsmith shop together with the variance petition. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is recommend denial of B2 requested zoning. In the alternative, staff recommends approval of the use variance to allow a gunsmith shop limited to the building and area described in the petition and its exhibits recommend approval for the requested variances. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning to approve a use variance to allow a gunsmith shop limited to the building and area described in the petition and its exhibits and approved of the requested variances. The chair will entertain a motion. Uh, I make a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Second. It moved and seconded to accept the staff recommendation. Is there any discussion? Anybody wish to comment on this? All those in favor of the zoning, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning ordinance passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-067 for the property located at 1933 West Isles Avenue. Petitioner is Miss Kimmies, LLC, as Lisey. Present zoning classification is S2, community shopping and off district section 155.031. Requested zoning relief of conditional permitted use pursuant to section 155.031C3. Conditional permitted uses in the S2 community shopping and office district taverns and section 155.200 taverns and a variance of section 155.200A2 to allow that for a tavern within 100 feet of the nearest lot on which there is a residence, church, park, school, community facility, or commercial daycare. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval of the requested conditional permitted use limited to approximately 1,600 square feet in a tenant space, 1933 West Isles Avenue, with hours of operation as per the city liquor license and approval of the requested variance. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission. Chair will entertain a motion. Motion to discuss, Mr. Mayor. Been moved to discuss. Is there a second? Second. Go ahead, Alderman. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, this is a situation where uh, Ms. Kimmies is moving from North Grand to um, a location in Ward 7 uh, in the Montvale Shopping District. This is, um, Ms. Kimmies is a video gaming parlor that received uh, City Council approval before we tightened the requirements of who would qualify for a gaming parlor. Historically, going back to 2012, I voted against the uh, video gaming ordinance when it came into the council for reasons which I won't go into now because I, the council is familiar with the reasons uh, of that vote. And I've, um, this is here before us tonight because in order to uh, for Ms. Kimmies to um, operate as a video gaming parlor at this location, they need a liquor license. And to get a liquor license, they need a zoning exception. So this is before us on a zoning case. And in summary, um, during my time on the council, I voted against every zoning request in order to permit video gaming. And I won't go into those reasons tonight because the council is familiar with those reasons. And so in, in, in summation, I've met with the owner of, the, of this gaming operation and, and also the landlord, and I've explained the reasons for my vote. And there was one objection to this from a residential 
neighbor, and I think the objection has to do with the prior tenant that did have uh, noise and those kinds of issues. So my reasons for voting no if someone makes a passage motion is not because of the objector. Um, it would be because of the, uh, the um, video gaming reasons. Alderman Hanauer. I want to make a motion we accept the uh, planning and zoning recommendation. Second. Second. Been moved and second to accept the planning and zoning commission recommendation and second it. Any discussion on that? Does anybody from the audience wish to address the issue? I have uh, one uh, clarification uh, with regards to the uh, parameters for parlors. Uh, it's my understanding, I thought that 60% has to be generated from food sales. That's correct, that Mr. Mayor. So this particular Kimmy's uh, originally received their liquor license when there was no restriction, or there was no requirement to have a certain percentage of your sales from liquor and, and, and food. And so now they're moving their liquor license that was granted uh, earlier in time. It, it may be an issue of first impression for the council whether a grandfathered right. video gaming parlor at one location can inherit and maintain that exception when they move to a different location. So that would be, uh, that issue I don't think arose uh, as a legal question during the time it was before the Zoning Commission. So that'd be my question, if you can transfer your parlors around town under the old code. Well, this the zoning code, or the zoning issue tonight is purely on the issue of the CPU for the tavern. And so the uh, license issue for the gaming is determined by the state. However, uh, we would have to look at the question of whether or not they would re retain their grandfather's status, uh, which is what I think, uh, Alderman, you're asking. Uh, and we would have to look at the uh, detail, if it's the business itself, if it's the corporation that's moving, and so on. Uh, I don't think that, uh, uh, I think we need the facts in order to give, uh, it is a case of first impression, and I think we need to get the specific facts. But this is only to grant the tavern CPU, the council technically does not actually vote on uh, gaming, you know, to grant gaming. Alderman Hanauer? Yeah, I, uh, I would like to know, I don't, I, I, as, as far as I know, I've nev never seen a report on, on uh, any audits of, <coughs> of certain businesses uh, that have gaming to see if, you know, to, to my knowledge, there's not been one. Um, is there... And, and I'm just bringing it up under this, but but I would like to see us have have some sort of report of of how many we've we've seen that have not uh, fit the guidelines and and what we've done. So I just, if we have one, I haven't. I don't remember. If uh, I'd request that Director McCarty uh, prepare a report with regards to the gaming parlors and uh, or the uh, restaurants or bars that have the video them, yeah. gaming. Uh, meeting the parameters of the 60% requirement. If you would, please. Alderman Tyler. Um, I th think it's been complaint-driven in the past for having them looked at. I know I've had a couple that I passed on to Todd Oliver's department that um, I had constituents that were concerned about the uh, percentages. And in one of the cases, it was a grandfathered license, so it didn't count. And in the other one, I think the... I don't know. I don't know exactly what the outcome of the of it was because I think the parlor closed. I'm pretty certain there have been at least three or four audits. They may have been by complaint, but we can check that via Todd and working also with OVM. And they they have the ability to check the sales tax, so uh, it's a uh, mechanism that is in place. But I think it has been complaint driven. But we'll find out for sure. Alderman Donlin. Just to add to Alderman Hanauer's comments, I asked for the same report about three or four weeks ago, and so I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We can see that. Thank you. And then uh, if the state uh, presents or grants the license for the video gaming, uh, who enforces it on our side with regards to the compliance? Well, the it would be by complaint. There would be an audit of basically with sales where... Um, there would be a comparison of gaming revenues versus, which, which again is all public. Uh, there's a website where you can go to see what the uh, gaming income is for every single licensee compared to the sales of beverages or food. 
and that's checked via uh, typically, I think, via the sales tax. It's my memory. I think the last one I saw, I think Dallas actually participated in getting the information uh, uh, through OBM, and then I think letters were sent, and I think we ended up getting, I think, the tax returns, if my memory serves me. But again, we'll, we can check on that. But they have to comply with the city ordinance, but the city ordinance, remember, is not dictating the gaming, it's actually controlling the liquor license. <coughs> so that if they are not in compliance, they would actually lose the liquor license, therefore the gaming. Because the state has sole um, authority in the area of uh, gaming, number of terminals and placement. I guess for my satisfaction on this case, I'd like to get an answer on the grandfather status because uh, I think that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, this is just going to open up the gates for others to move around at, at their leisure. And I think the intent was not to have a proliferation or just, you know, the ability to move around the city with regards to that, unless one of the aldermen that served at the council at that point in time has a different recollection. Alderman Turner? I was here at that time, and I don't think it, I don't think it was ever an issue with regard to where they were located. I think it was just an issue with regard to the business. And if it's the same business and not spinning off into two or three other businesses, I don't see why it would be an issue. Alderman Tyler? My recollection is the same as Alderman Turner's. I don't remember the issue of the businesses moving around coming up at all. I think the issue at hand was limiting the number of them that could be just gaming parlors without being, I think the, at the time, and was it Alderman Job who brought up that it was intended to help restaurant and restaurants and bars that were struggling? It was not intended to create all these miniature gaming parlors all over the place. And I believe that was the intent of the ordinance at the time, was to make sure that it was helping the, the entities that were struggling instead of creating a new entity. You're absolutely right. So if, if this business was on North Grand and it was grandfathered in, if it moves to another location, it's still the same business. Mr. Mayor. Alderman McBenema. <coughs> well, we're raising some good issues, and, and this is uncharted territory because, I, mm -hmm. to my recollection, this is the first grandfathered a video gaming parlor is moving from one location to a different location. But what we have here is uh, there are three pre-existing um, video gaming um, licenses within 500 feet of this new location. And the pre-existing video gaming licenses belong to traditional restaurants or taverns. So we're, get, we're bringing a non-traditional gaming parlor to a location that has three traditional video gaming um, proprietors. So that's something to be considered. Alderman Hanauer and then Alderwoman Turner. I, I guess my question would be, I mean, we can always, would it be something that we could always uh, pass another ordinance saying from here on out if a, if a grandfathered um, business moves, um, they lose a grandfather because my concern is is if if a, if one of these businesses are not doing well in one area they they're free to go around wherever they want in the city and I don't think that I'm not going to speak for the previous councils but I, I I really don't wouldn't think that would was their intent at the time <coughs> it was to give the people that were located the where they were okay you're good but you know I just think that it ought to be something maybe we need to, that's a loose end we need to tie up. But I don't think we can do anything right now on this particular case. All the women, Turner? But I don't think, I think we're, we're talking about a business, and I don't think you can penalize a business because they choose to move from one location to another location. Uh, if, if they decide that for whatever, we, I mean, we don't know why they're moving. It's not really any of our business why they're moving. They decided that they could, uh, their, their business could, could benefit more by another location. So I don't know that we as a council want to penalize a business because we don't like where they're moving. Um, and if the issue is that um, Alderman McMenamin doesn't feel that there should be another video parlor 
within a certain proximity of three others, then that's a whole separate issue than um, the one that's at hand. Any other discussion? All those in favor to approve as recommended by the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes ten or seven voting yes, one voting no, and one voting present. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-069 for the property located at 3051 Hollis Drive. Petitioner is Hospital Sisters Health System. Present zoning classification is R5B. General residence in Office District Section 155.021. Requested zoning relief of variance of Section 155.311. Non-illuminated name plates and identification signs 155.314. Illuminated signs and 155.315. Residential and Office District signs conformance to permit the proposed signs. An illuminated wall sign 95 square feet in size on the front of the building which projects 12 inches above the wall and a monument sign near the corner of Hollis and Robbins Road of 15 square feet for a total of both signs is 110 square feet. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission. The chair will entertain a motion. Um, Mayor, I make a motion that we accept the uh, recommendation of the Sangamon <laughs> County Regional Planning Commission. Second. Second. It moved and second to accept the Sangman, Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation. Second, any discussion? All those in favor of the zoning ordinance vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-070 for the property located at 1801 Business Park Drive and 2850 Old Rochester Road. Petitioner is Don Curtis, LLC. Present zoning classification is I-1, Light Industrial Se District, Section 155.040. Requested zoning relief of variance of Section 155.114B. Regulations for the location of off-street parking facilities for lots one and two to use the off-street parking spaces which currently exist and are located in a required front yard setback and Section 155.061D, basic yard requirements for lot one for year rear yard setback and setback of zero feet instead of the 20 feet required per code. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the planning recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission. Chair will entertain a motion. Approve as submitted. Second. And moved and second to approved as submitted. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-0071 for the property located at 2833 and 2901 East Cook Street. Petitioners depend a Bull Motors Inc. 1 Present zoning classification I-1 Light Industrial District, Section 155.040. Requested zoning relief of variance of Section 155.112. Surfacing to allow construction of an off-street park parking and vehicle storage area of dustless millings and rock without requiring a wearing surface of asphaltic concrete and or comparable hard surface 155.136 regulations for surfacing of off-street loading facilities to allow the construction of open off-street loading space for of dustless millings of rock without requiring a durable hard surface pavement 155.143 plan of off-street parking or loading areas to proceed with constructing an off, open off-street parking and vehicle storage of dustless rock and millings without the requiring plans of accessory off-street parking areas or building permit. And 155.480 landscape screening and lighting regulations to allow construction of a parking area without a requiring landscape plan, including but not limited to an installation and maintenance of parking, lot landscaping screening and lighting and the points related thereto. Specifically, petitioner requests a five-year period to be in compliance with sections 155.112, 155.136, 155.143, 155.144,
Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval limited to two years. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission for granting the two year time frame with the application of a dust palliative. Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, I make a motion to approve the petition as submitted. Second. Second. Been moved and second to accept the petition as submitted. Any discussion? All, all those in favor of the motion of approving the petition as submitted, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <coughs> and the zoning request passes nine voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2018-072 for the property located at 2375, 2387, 2401, 2425, and 2451 West Monroe Street and 2600 and 2612 Farragut Drive. Petitioner is MLR Properties, LLC. Present zoning classification is R5, Office District Section 155.022, and R3B, General Residence District Section 155.018 with the use variance docket 78-26, allowing professional and administrative office uses as permitted in the R5 reclassification. Requested zoning relief, a variance of the residence office signs, regulation section 155.311, non-illuminated name plates and identification signs, and office district sign conform conformance. Five previously <coughs> separate office buildings have been combined into one single building of 350,311 square feet. Petitioner desires to install a comprehensive suite of signs on the extended campus, which are desi described in Exhibit B. The variances would allow a total of up to 600 square feet of wall and ground signage, illuminated and non-illuminated signs for the office campus and parking facilities. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation as amended is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is approved. The amended Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation and approve the petitioner's petition. Chair will entertain a motion. I move to accept the st uh, staff recommendation as amended. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the staff recommendation as amended and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor of the zoning ordinance as submitted as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the zoning ordinance passes nine voting yes, none voting no. And that concludes the zoning portion of our meeting. time the chair will recognize Treasurer Busher for the presentation of the financial report. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. The corporate fund in the month of November had a beginning balance of $7,628,277. We took in total receipts of $8,998,563. We had total disbursements in the month of November of $9,969,856 which left the corporate fund with an ending balance in the month of November of $6,656,984. This concludes my report, Mayor Langfelder. Thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the financial report. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. This time I'd like to uh, introduce Doug Brown and the Energy Authority representatives to give a presentation. So we have T coming in tonight to do uh, basically an update on the integrated resource plan. Um, Jamie Manny's here to represent T and kind of give a, a kind of a brief as we can um, update uh, for this process. 
and kind of give some more details in the, what's going into the IRP. So I'll turn it over to Jamie. Thank you, good evening, thank you for having me. Uh, Jamie Maney, uh, resident of Jacksonville, Florida, uh, here on behalf of the Energy Authority. Say that again, what's your last name? <clears throat> Maney, M-A-H-N-E. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to give you a brief update, remind you who the Energy Authority is, uh, and then talk you through the process that we're going through with regards to the Integrated Resource Plan, where we're um, situated today within that plan, and also what our next steps are. Um, so, as a reminder, uh, the Energy Authority is a nonprofit energy trading and, and advisory services company. Um, we are owned by public power utilities similar to CWLP, who are located across the country, and we serve only um, public power utilities like CWLP. Um, we uh, foc focus really on maximizing the value of your assets in the market, is really our job and uh, as well as providing advisory services to ensure that future assets are valuable uh, in the market for our utilities. Uh, the Energy Authority is owned by eight public power utilities, uh, as I mentioned, located across the U.S. In addition to those eight, we serve another 50 utilities across the U.S. Um, that are all, again, state or locally owned. The services we provide, uh, specific to CWLP, we provide portfolio management, which is really long-term planning, uh, power supply, risk management uh, with regards to energy supply. We provide RTO market trading, so we are the interface to the mid-continent mid ISO, or the MISO market, uh, in which CWLP operates. Uh, we also provide bilateral energy trading services with other counterparties where necessary, and then advisory services. The integrated resource plan is one of those advisory services that we are providing. Uh, we've performed uh, uh, integrated resource plans for numerous clients in the Northwest, for Gainesville Regional Utilities, for Conway, Arkansas, uh, for Springfield, Missouri, as well as others. Excuse me, if you have any yes. abbreviations, can you explain what those abbreviations are? Example, yes. The RTO. So yeah, I apologize. I try to I try to remove them, but uh, RTO is regional. Transmission Organization, Thank you. and that's a, that's a generic name for uh, MISO, the Mid-Continent mid uh, Independent System Operator. There are other RTOs located across the U.S. Uh, who perform services similar to what MISO does in the Midwest. Any other questions? Right, so the IRP process flow, um, really our process uh, includes you know, over, th over 2,000 person hours going into this project, but I tried to distill it down into three um, steps that we can talk through. Um, those are developing the assumptions and the scenarios for the IRP, uh, creating the model and running that model, uh, and then processing those results and developing an action plan. Um, really, the, the middle box is one that, that TEA performs mostly on its own. Uh, the first and the third box really is with the input of the utility um, and as we'll talk about the community and the, and the council as well. So the first step, uh, as we went through to develop assumptions and scenarios, so there are quite a few assumptions, as you could guess, that must go into this model um, before we can uh, determine what the output might look like. So the first, uh, and I'll just highlight a few of those, um, although there are other uh, assumptions and, and inputs into this model, but the first is a load forecast, or a forecast of how much energy will be used uh, within Springfield in the next 20 years. Um, and that's really, in, in, if you look backwards, uh, it was in previous years a more simple task, and really the reason was that if you built so many homes or if your local economy grew by X percent, typically uh, energy usage would follow on a pretty linear basis. And so it was pretty easy to determine how much energy was going to grow based on what your projections of the economy were. Uh, but a lot has changed since then. And so now you think about people, um, you know, when you build a new home, it uses a fraction of the electricity that a home 10 years ago built. Um, if people replace their light bulbs uh, in an existing home, suddenly their usage is going down with every light bulb they replace. If they buy an electric car, suddenly their usage goes way up, um, but typically overnight. And so, um, so there's a lot changing in the world that, that really wasn't the way it was 20 years ago in the utility industry. Um, and so we do have more complex imp in inputs, um, but we are still forecasting uh, that usage over the next 20 years, um, again, based uh, primarily on econ econometric factors, um, growth in the community, as well as other uh, impacts that we see locally. Fuel costs, um, traditionally, um, you know, uh, coal was a, was a pretty um, 
uh, low cost and non-volatile source of fuel for electric production. Um, natural gas was a very volatile um, a source of, of fuel, um, you know, back when Katrina hit uh, the Gulf Coast um, because it shut in a lot of, of natural gas uh, uh, supply, prices really spiked during that time period. And so traditionally those, those were kind of in different uh, scenarios than they are today. Today, coal has a lot of projected potential volatility based on maybe some uh, carbon legislation that could make it more expensive, not so much because the coal itself is gonna be more expensive, um, but all of the regulations around burning coal uh, that could be more expensive in the future. Whereas natural gas, due to fracking, which I know you're all familiar with, um, due to hydraulic fracturing and the, and the discovery of new natural gas or the ability to get to new natural gas deposits, um, really natural gas looks very stable um, from a price perspective out into the future, which is really just a change in the last 10 years in our industry um, that's kind of turned it on its head. If you think about uh, renewable uh, generation, uh, in the past, renewables have always you know, existed. They've always been pretty high priced uh, and gradually decreasing. What we've seen in more recent years is that the price declines of, of wind and solar generation are dec decreasing very rapidly, as well as being boosted by, um, by tax credits uh, from the federal government and also local governments uh, to make them even more competitive. And so again, 10 years ago, high price, gradually moving, um, really more recently, much lower priced and, uh, and dropping quickly. System limitations, so of course we have to take into account uh, the physical realities of the system when we look at what the future resource plan might look like. Um, for instance, uh, Dolman 4 um, couldn't be retired necessarily without being replaced locally um, by a reliable, meaning not uh, intermittent, not solar or wind, but a, a reliable baseload generation of equal or, uh, uh, or greater size, really due to transmission limitations. So power flows, where power can actually get from and to on the system. Um, and so if you move one, remove of one piece of that, that doesn't mean that generation from all across the system could immediately flow back in to where that hole is. So there are physical limitations that we have to take into account when we look at uh, the resource plan. Um, similarly, if you think about solar generation, obviously in the southwest of the United States where it's very sunny, Arizona has probably got um, some of the cheapest solar in the country, right? But physically, <laughs> it's limiting to try to buy solar in, in Arizona and, and ship it to uh, Springfield. And so we have to understand the physical realities of the system uh, and how that would impact us locally. So this is just a, uh, a picture as we talked about the load forecast, our annual demand and energy forecast. Really the important thing about this pic these two pictures is really the shape. Um, so in all of our scenarios, if you look at how much usage is pro projected locally, you see it going down in all of these scenarios. And, uh, and really that's due to um, greater efficiency, that's due to a slowing economy. Um, relative to, to, uh, to past growth year over year. Um, and, uh, and so that's part of, our, part of our scenario analysis as we look forward. Question. Yes. So how much the volatility is in that projection if, say, one or two manufacturing companies came here and opened up a couple of different spots? Like if something amazing happened and we opened up spots both yep. at the old Fiat Alice and Pillsbury, and they're back up in production. How volatile is that forecast? Right. Um, in, in the model today, the <laughs> forecast itself is not volatile. What's volatile or what changes are the scenarios that we consider. Uh, we do not have a, we'll go through the scenarios, but we do not have a scenario that says, hey, there's a, there's a new aluminum smelter moving to town and it's gonna you know, double our, our energy usage locally. Um, there is not a, a scenario for that. Um, but that is the type of thing that we take into account when we look um, you know, at the local level. And other IRPs that we have done have taken that into account where there was a big account or a, or a large manufacturing facility that was, that was, you know, likely to come or potentially uh, to come. And so we brought that into, into the scenario. That is not one of the scenarios that we've considered for Springfield at this time. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. So other assumptions, uh, obviously we had to look at existing units and the cost of those units both now and, uh, and in the future. So um, this is an interesting challenge. If you think about a bulldozer uh, that may be pushing coal around at units, uh, Dolman units one through three, um, that the, you, you can't really assign a third of that bulldozer to each of the units because even if two of those units went away, the bulldozer would still need to be there, right? Um, so it's a little bit more complex than just saying, you know, this unit costs X and this one Y. 
um, there are a lot of interdependencies that go into that. Um, and uh, But we do try to eat that out, both the fixed costs of those units uh, as well as variable costs like fuel and transportation of that fuel. Um, we also look at capital investments that are required on those units. So Dolman 1 through 3 are all facing significant capital upgrades, um, uh, improvements to uh, the system due to new uh, environmental regulations um, that are required of those units. Finally, and, and, and uh, it's only one bullet on here, but it's pretty important, um, we then have to go in and determine what are the scenarios that are valuable for us to run. So um, again, the IRP model is looking at a 20-year projection, and it assumes that it has perfect foresight. And what that means is that um, the model knows what the answer is for all 20 of those years when it starts. And so if you knew what the economy was going to be in 20 years, you'd know exactly what to invest in today if you knew you know, where Apple was going to be 20 years from now. Well, the model kind of knows that because we're feeding the prices into it. Um, in reality, those, it's, it's, it's not perfect. That's not what's actually going to happen in the future. And that's why we create the scenarios uh, to shock kind of the system uh, into different futures so that we can see how do how do the resource plans stack up in in different alter, alternative futures uh, within the model? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Do those models also include like uh, take into account if um, if the subsidies come off or if you know they, they start seeing issues on you know the certain renewables or whatever right. for one reason or another or like there's a problem with fracking and all of a sudden, that is a, there's an issue with, say, health around the fracking area or around the wind turbines or, you know. Uh, some of those, yes. Not, not every scenario you just mentioned or not every, you know, alternative uh, there. So, um, so we do have a scenario, for instance, that uh, assumes a much higher gas price. Um, and that could be caused by, um, I don't know, all the, all the fracking areas drying up, or it could be caused by a health issue or, or some other reason why, uh, why, frack, why gas prices would rise. So it's implied in that. It's not necessarily that we said, hey, let's, let's um, uh, you know, let's assume there's a lawsuit or something. Um, it wasn't that. We assumed that there was an increase in that price, and what would that do to the, to the portfolio. Um, similarly, we looked at other scenarios that put a price on carbon. Um, or that required renewables to a certain percentage for the local community. Um, and so all of those things you know, are, are uh, included in the, in the analysis. So uh, to that, these are the scenarios um, that were developed. The ones on the left um, really was, uh, these are our, our base scenarios that we started with. And the reason we started with these is that these are what the Mid-Continent ISO, MISO, uh, is using in their planning process. So their planning process is for a multi-state uh, area for the Midwest and, and, and Mid-South regions. Um, they're looking at hundreds of utilities and, and, and millions of megawatt hours. And so they have the same type of process going on to determine where transmission investments need to be made. And uh, we, and I, I believe many of the participants within that market, uh, use those as our scenarios as well. So that, at least for our, for, as a start, uh, that way we're consistently planning locally uh, the way that the region, the inputs that the region is using to plan uh, what's going on more broadly in the region. Does that make sense? Um, so those, uh, you know, we have a few here. Continued fleet change. If you think about the status quo, there's a lot of retirements in coal uh, and build-outs of natural gas. There's wind coming on. If you think of that, that curve of change, um, just continuing into the future. Um, there's an accelerated fleet change where you see that happening more quickly. Um, uh, uh, limited fleet change where maybe something changes where that, that happens a little bit more slowly. Maybe gas prices rise, for instance. Um, and then uh, looking at that, but more on the distributed side. So what about electric vehicles? What about uh, solar panels on people's rooftops? There's a scenario that takes into consideration uh, emerging technologies kind of upsetting the industry and changing uh, the area. So while those are regional assumptions and regional scenarios, we apply them locally uh, to Springfield. So there's still the, re the report, the output of the report is still Springfield specific. Um, just the inputs are coming from uh, a third part. 
But then the utility worked with you guys uh, and sought uh, public comment about additional uh, scenarios or issues or ideas uh, that should be incorporated into the integrated resource plan. And those are the scenarios that we've captured on the right. So um, the feedback that, that they received was pretty far ranging. Um, and what we tried to do is distill those into scenarios that captured a lot of those concerns or questions or impacts. Um, and so um, uh, to, to, to your question, um, with regards to um, you know a fracking incident, rather than looking at a fracking incident, we looked at different gas prices. So that 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 includes a fracking incident, but it also could include anything that would impact gas prices in that way. And so we looked at it, you know, tried to develop a scenario that encompassed several of those type of of uh, questions. So by default, uh, the model is using um, the gas prices that that MISO uses. And uh, and we wanted to look at a scenario that uses the NYMEX forward price for natural gas, which is much lower than what uh, the Midcontinent ISO is using in forward years. Uh, we had to extrapolate it out because it only goes so far, but uh, essentially it just creates a lower gas price out into the future to see what that would look like uh, and what it would do to the uh, portfolio. Um, Second scenario, we, we uh, forced a 30% renewable requirement onto CWLP's portfolio. So if, if as a community decided that we wanted a 30% renewable portfolio standard uh, within Springfield, this is what the resource portfolio would look like if we did that. Uh, some of the input received centered around climate change, and the way that we gathered that was to look at seasonal extremes. Um, so specifically looking at uh, high heat events in the summer and high uh, or low cold events in the winter um, on a more frequent basis, like every five years relative to historical patterns. Um, and, and again, showed what that is going to look like. Um, the fourth scenario is really more uh, stricter environmental regulations, uh, carbon tax. Is, is essentially what you can think of there. Uh, so a price on carbon um, is, uh, is what that is. And then finally, um, looking at high coal prices. So we're including a scenario that assumes that the, the low coal prices that CWLP has, has historically enjoyed um, go away for some other reason. You know? um, and, uh, and so what would that do to, to the remaining portfolio? So uh, it's important to note that CWLP is actually, you know, these were the original scenarios that we put together, um, and uh, and we've created um, some uh, preliminary uh, output from these scenarios. CWLP, both in seeing those as well as just maturing over these months, um, has given us uh, some additional scenarios uh, to include and to consider as well, and we're in the process of building those out. Um, those will not impact our ultimate uh, end date, the duration of, of the project, um, so that's important to note. But we are still working on uh, the full set of scenarios uh, to report out next year. Uh, this is just an example of the gas price forecast. So you can see really the important thing here is that you see that there is quite, quite a range of different gas price forecasts. I think the, uh, the top line is, um, is, is one of the scenarios that MISO provided. Um, the bottom line, the green line on the bottom, that's the NYMEX forward curve. So again, it shows a much lower gas price for a lot longer out into, into uh, time um, in that scenario. Good. So the second step, which is really, you know, and it's an iterative process, but really the majority of our work right now is, is happening in the second step uh, to create and run the models. So the creation of those models once we had the assumptions in place, um, putting them into our software system, um, getting all the inputs together, vetting those inputs, and then running the models, which is, which is quite a, a task from, from a computer uh, processing standpoint. Um, Importantly, what we're doing is we're modeling CWLP system economically. So we're looking at prices, we're looking at projected prices, and, and, and the price could be higher, it could be lower, but we're looking at costs and we're looking at market prices. Um, we are not looking at other issues um, that need to be taken into account before any actual decisions are made, like human resource issues, um, like local concerns, uh, you know, uh, things that, that, that drive the utility uh, with regards to um, potentially diversity of resources. So not all utilities want to have just one type of asset because 
if you pick the wrong scenario or the, the different scenario happens and all that all of your generation is coming from gas and gas does indeed go way up um, then suddenly you're stuck with with you know just one type of resource so um, so those are the type of things that that really the utility um, needs to layer onto the decision making process after our model runs just the pure economics of, of the models um, these are just price forecasts, so power price forecasts. Again, the, the example um, is really here just to show you that there uh, is quite a spread between those so that we're, we're considering different alternative futures or scenarios and what could happen locally to the CWLP node. Um, importantly, we're modeling this. It's a very complex model. But we're modeling what happens locally uh, based on power flows, like how power can flow from Indiana to Illinois or you know, from south to north. From, and, and so we're looking locally at, at what the transmission would allow to happen within CWLP and how that would impact prices. So the last step uh, is to process these results and develop an action plan. So um, post-processing and aggregation of all the scenario outcomes um, and, and looking at the scenarios. So again, the scenarios don't, there's a perceived likelihood that some of these scenarios are gonna happen. As we said, the first scenario was sort of, you know, continued fleet change. That might be the expected case. And you may not really believe that fleets are going to change much more quickly, or you may not believe that electric vehicles are going to, are going to be in everyone's driveway in 10 years. Um, and so these don't have an equal possibility of happening. They're different you know, kind of future scenarios that we take to kind of create a, a complete picture of what it could look like and how, you, how the, the uh, portfolio may be impacted by those different scenarios. Um, so we'll, we will develop an outcome, though, based on those and, and recommend, um, uh, create a recommendation based on those study results. Again, those, those recommendations are based on economics only, um, and it really is up to CWLP with your input um, to think about the individual risk of your utility, uh, the needs of your um, uh, constituents locally, and, uh, and to, to uh, create a plan going forward. And so that would include, you know, again, thoughts about labor, the labor pool locally, economic impacts if you retired or built a unit locally, um, adding renewables, um, even if they're more expensive, just because locally that's important to us, um, or, uh, or resource diversity, as I mentioned. And then finally, CWLP develops an action plan. Certainly we will assist with that and uh, provide guidance, but ultimately it's the utility's decision uh, with your input to, to develop that plan. We don't, we, you know, we, we're not going out to build the, the resources, and so we think that it's important that we have that input um, and, uh, and that CWLP owns that action. This is, um, I just want to create uh, some expectation. This is one piece of, of the output, um, and this is a sample of what you might see um, in the final report. And, uh, and the reason it's important is just, just you know, to take a second look at it. If you look down the left-hand side, you see the different scenarios that we're considering, right? And again, this is genericized. This isn't, this isn't your actual scenarios. Um, it's just a sample. And then if you look across the top, you see the different results or the different options that you have from a resource perspective. So you could build a unit type X, let's say that's a solar unit, or you could build unit type Y, let's say that's a new natural gas plant. Um, you could retire one of the existing units. Um, the important thing about this is that if you think about scenario planning, um, looking at this from left to right, choosing one row and, and choosing that as your future, is probably not the way to use this because that scenario is unlikely to happen. Um, any of these scenarios are unlikely to happen. They're just different views of what the future could hold. But if you look at it from a column down and you said, well, in this case, um, retiring unit Z is a good outcome in almost every scenario, then it's pretty safe to assume that retiring unit Z is a good decision from a resource planning standpoint. And so you have to look at it holistically to say, well, these are all the things that could occur and there are actions that I could take that work out in most instances um, and determining how likely I think those instances are gonna be. And that's why it's a conversation, not just a, um, you know, a dictate uh, in terms of what you go out and do. So that's the type of information that you're gonna receive as well as a, a lengthy write-up um, that describes this, uh, but uh, it, that gives you an, a sense in, the, in a very simplified fashion of, of the type of, of information that you receive to be able to make those decisions. Um, 
we're going to interject a little bit. You know, there are some key preliminary takeaways that are that, that we're noticing right now, and we thought it would be interesting. None of these probably are a surprise to you, um, except maybe the last or uh, the third one. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, the second one. But um, uh, coal plants obviously are becoming more expensive to operate and maintain. Um, really, that's due to capital improvements, uh, new emissions requirements on units, um, as well as their competitiveness versus natural gas and the lowering price of other fuels. Um, secondly, renewable prices are low enough um, to be really a viable alternative um, to, to uh, coal and, and natural gas. Um, not necessarily for every hour of the day, obviously, um, but they are very uh, competitive with regards to the other um, systems. Uh, hydraulic fracturing, fracking, has certainly changed the world um, in the last few years, um, and, and it's impacted everything, probably nothing more so than the utility industry, um, and, uh, and it's absolutely changed the natural gas market. And um, um, as we showed in, in the, the load forecast, we do expect that CWLP's load is, is going to continue to decline, not rapidly, but continue to decline, which is really a change from the past where you could expect three or five percent growth year over year, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. So as a status update, um, the original scenario study modeling is complete, as I said, the, the, those scenarios I showed you. Um, we, have, we have completed uh, the initial scenarios there. Again, we're working on some additional um, scenarios that CWLP has given us. Um, this is the one that I said maybe you wouldn't be expecting. The fourth uh, bullet here is that we do recommend um, now that CWLP issue a request for proposals, an RFP, <laughs> Um, prior to the end of the full integrated resource plan process for renewables. And, and that may seem out of order. Why would we you know, go build or, or buy renewables if we don't know what the full portfolio would look like? Um, there's a, a couple of reasons. Um, one, in, in, in all of our preliminary, uh, if not most, if not all of our preliminary results, um, renewables are very competitive with, uh, with other resources. Two, there's a time sensitivity to renewables. So, uh, right now, there are federal production tax credits that are applied to wind generation and federal investment tax credits that are applied to solar generation. Um, those are ratcheting down um, you know, every year. And uh, so the sooner that we're able to um, get those contracts in place, uh, the sooner that uh, the builder can take advantage of those tax credits and give us a better price. Um, and some of those are based on when you put a shovel in the ground or when you buy uh, construction-ready materials, not necessarily when it's producing uh, electricity, especially in the solar case. Um, the third reason is that during this study, we've used, we've used good recent proxy data for renewable costs, um, but it's not local. Right? So if we go off an RFP, we can get actual executable prices from counterparties. So right now we know generally how much it costs to build wind. We don't know exactly what it costs to build wind in Springfield or to buy wind from the neighboring county. Um, doing an RFP process would give us the more specific prices that would, again, feed back into this whole process. Um, and there's very, very little doubt that um, that, that will be part of this, the portfolio. Um, and I'm not saying go out and buy 100% of all of CWLP's needs for, for renewables. We'll talk about the, the quantities, but um, getting that process started now um, may be advantageous to the utility. So that's really, um, that's, that's really the end of, of where we are today. Um, and these are the, the interim recommendations um, that we're making. We are, uh, uh, again, working on the additional scenarios that CWLP has given us. We don't think that's going to push the ultimate timeline back. Um, and so um, we've got, um, you know, we're wrapping that up as we speak. Uh, we'll be writing up the report uh, in the new year and then bringing uh, that to you guys, um, you know, later in the first quarter, early second quarter. Alderman Dolan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you, you alluded to this in one of your last comments yes. and, and uh, about the, in order to do an RFP, I would think you'd, you'd need to have a quantity. Yes. Uh, for renewables. Yep. Um, are you at liberty to say what that quantity is today or right. how, how, how you arrived at that number if right. you have? Uh, no, I'm not at liberty to say what the quantity is today. Uh, what we would um, you know, recommend is that we go out for a safe quantity, right? So we know we need X number of, 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 of megawatts um, and, and there won't be a scenario where that's too much. Um, we may later need even more. 
um, but that quantity would allow us to, um, to, to, to get prices um, to be a quantity that CWLP is willing to execute, that we bidders have confidence that, that they're really in the market, not just price shopping. Um, and uh, and so, so the, the, again, it seems out of order, but, but there's a little method to the madness would there. Would it be wind and or solar? Yes, or? I think so. It would be wind and or solar. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to going out for an RFP on that. I, I, I just am, we just got out of a wind contract that cost the city, the rate pair is 130, 100, what, 130 or 135? $135 million. Right. Dollars. Um, I just want to make sure that whatever we do going forward, that we have full executable rights to get out of the contract and they're not locked in at some exorbitant uh, pricing and you know but more than anything we should be able to terminate the contract at the city's discretion bar none and uh, I mean that's the only way I would would be in favor of something like that I don't want to get caught up in another 135 million dollar debacle and it, it costs our rate pairs, I'm going to say again, $135 million, and that's absolutely uncalled for. So, Mr. Zirkel, if you minimum. can uh, make sure that happens, um, no pressure. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mayor. You know, we, we need new ways of thinking about things, and what I just heard there was kind of an old way of thinking from my point of view because we're fixated on that $130 million renewables decision that was made 10 years ago. But I've heard our general manager, Doug Brown, state on San Madonia Talk Radio, he talked about the decision to build the coal-fired power plant. And just as we can say, if we know now what, if, if we could have known back then what we know now about the ever-lowering price of wind power, Doug Brown said, well, if we knew back then what we know now about coal-fired plants, we would have never built the coal-fired plant, which was a billion-dollar spending decision. So uh, any alderman that gets up here and bangs their horn and says, that was a $130 million debacle, you know, someone else can say that was a billion-dollar coal-fired debacle. So we just got to... Um, keep the full perspective of what's happened to our utility and look f positive going forward. But if, if all of them keep bring, bringing back that wind power, I'm going to bring back the coal. So, you know, what's fair is fair. So I just want to get that out there. I think it's important to remember our history so we don't get locked into uh, costly contracts. And I think that's the point that was received. And that's one of the reasons we uh, dipped our toe into the solar, uh, you know, see what the operational costs are. But that's something that we're going to be cognizant of uh, because, you know, this council took progressive steps to right the fiduciary ship of the utility. And we're not going to put it at risk. Uh, and we need to do our due diligence uh, when we move in these different directions and find the right blend of energy for our future. Alderman Cena. Uh, I have a couple questions, so bear yes, with sir. me, please. Um, when you when you did the scenarios, did you compare Springfield with any other like size cities, or was it just monogamous to Springfield? The um, the the a little bit of both. Um, so the scenarios certainly we didn't just grab them out of the air. Um, that we absolutely relied on some of the experience that we've had with other utilities, and again with the Mid Continent ISO scenarios that we started with, um, that really really are regional planning scenarios that other utilities are likely using in their um, similar things. So um, so so a little bit of both, but there were some specific things that that really came out of the, the public comment and out of your guys' um, wishes uh, that that. Uh, distilled into scenarios from the utility. And then the second part, I'm going to piggyback off of Alderman Donilon. If, if we don't know what the quantity of renewables you're looking at, how do we know we're getting what we're supposed to be getting? Because you said you couldn't, right. you weren't at liberty to tell us what those quantities were. Uh, just here so, and now. I mean, before before the utility releases an RFP, I think they'll have all that information. I, I just I, I just didn't oh, want to state don't have yeah, that quantity you don't today. Want, okay. That's right. Yeah. Alderman Turner. Thank you. Um, I I think that 
what Alderman Hanauer, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that what Alderman Hanauer was doing was offering a cautionary tale. And, um, and I agree with the mayor that we have to definitely learn from the past. And I would hope that prior to decisions being made that those, um, those things would come to the council for a lively discussion and we won't have concrete decisions made in a, in a vacuum that we then have to go back and try to undo or uh, talk about why, what if. So I, I would just want to put that out there in the atmosphere that I would hope that um, prior to decisions being made that they would come back to this council for discussion. Alderman Tyler. Um, I echo what Alderman Turner and Alderman Hanauer had to say. Um, I remember coming on as an alderman in 2007, and these decisions were already made. They were already voted on. There's not a single member of the horseshoe here who was alderman or mayor or even any elected position when those decisions were made. And I don't even think any of the management at CWLP was in management level decision making at the time that those decisions were made in 2004, 2005, 2006. So I think the idea of being cautious about moving forward, everything that I remember from that first term under Mayor Davlin, the, ex the expectation was based on the projections that we had, and I don't know who gave us those projections, so I can't say that it was T, I can't say that it was the, our own, I don't know where they came from, it's been too long. But the projections at the time were that this was going to be a money maker for Springfield and there was even discussion of going bigger. And the construction was held up over the wind contract and we ended up in what turned out to be ultimately a bad one. Not saying that renewables aren't the future and that some of these contracts could be beneficial, but I echo what Alderman Hanauer said of not letting us get locked into something that could be long-term damaging to the utility. I am looking forward to seeing what happens with CWLP when this contract completely falls off because the ultimate goal across the board is for our constituents. We want to make sure that we're providing power, reliable power, as few outages as possible and keep the rates as low as possible for the municipal utility. That should be our ultimate goal. It isn't whether it's coal, it isn't whether it's propane, it isn't whether it's solar, nuclear, whatever the future holds. The goal is to make sure that our citizens have reliable power that they can count on at a price that we keep maintained that they can afford. And I think that's the thing that everybody needs to remember going forward. All the way, McMinimum. Well, I, I think we all agree caution is, is extremely important here. Um, and I refer to the coal plant as a $1 billion um, investment because the cost to build was half a billion, but the financing cost adds, adds, adds another half billion. My point in bringing that up is that I, did, I think that um, what I find uh, unacceptable is that there's just one scapegoat, one fall guy for our past decisions. and. Um, that's what I um, think is inappropriate, that uh, wind, renewable energy, and those that push that are, um, they kind of get a bad rap, I think, because actually what their real goal was to avoid the coal plant, and then the wind was, renewables is, was what they were pushing for, um, but then we negotiated inflexible fixed price contracts going out 10 years. That was the real killer for the city as opposed to having a more flexible uh, purchasing arrangement with shorter contracts and then allowing ourselves to adjust to the then current price of wind energy. Um, I think, Mayor, what we're doing here with the integrated resource plan is very positive because what we're trying to do is careful decision making. And uh, I think the one curveball tonight is that while we're going through this careful decision making, we're receiving a recommendation that we ought to do an RFP for renewables and that would be kind of on a short time frame because we ex 
because our recommendation we heard tonight was to get that started while the IRP process is still in being. Well, the IRP, the integrated resource plan is going to end in, a, in six months. So I think you're recommending that our, you know, utility management folks uh, get on, start issuing requests for proposals and make decisions. And that's, I think, um, the kind of the trick bag we're in maybe um, when we talk about caution and talk about being careful. Maybe you want to respond to that. Yes, sir. Uh, so the, um, the, the to just to clarify, so request for proposals is, is that a request for proposals with no obligation to actually sign any. Um, and, uh, and then two, from a timing perspective, um, I don't necessarily expect that that entire process could be completed before this is completed. Um, but the sooner we get those actual prices, because I think the output of this is going to include some portion of, of renewables, having that price refresh into this process will allow that, because this isn't kind of a one and done, there's gonna be some iteration and conversation and having that better information um, is gonna be important to that conversation and iteration. So the um, request for proposal yields information doesn't necessarily yield a final decision um, or could but it, it, it could, yeah. it could and, and I think you want the market to know that we're serious um, otherwise they're not going to get us serious prices but um, but that's not an obligation to necessarily sign one of those yeah, when it comes to the RFPs um, definitely not obligated to do anything with, with them. Um, so it's not really a final decision. It's going to come, you know, any kind of final decision would have to come from the council no matter what. But um, I think that's going to be part of the process, though, um, is, is being able to provide all this information, um, as well as depending upon what the scenario, all the ultimate scenarios provide, we might have other RFPs that we want to go out for just purchasing power off the grid. So there's other options that we'll be pursuing eventually, but um, I think the, the more interesting thing is on renewables is more of the tax credit issues and how they fall off, that we want to pursue that. Um, and we might have varying levels of options that we want to pursue just for price breaks to see what we can come up with, what's, what's the best uh, combination that we can you know, put forward maybe with the different scenarios that might fit. So. Uh, Early next year, we would probably plan on putting some kind of an RFP out on the market. We're currently working on it now. Um, so we'll kind of keep you informed as that goes along. And before uh, or when we do the RFP or all this evolves, one thing, we're not going to pass on the renewables through a fuel adjustment. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this uh, IRP is to lower the usage rate and how can we drive costs down. So uh, we can't just, uh, from CWLP standpoint, and this was their philosophy previously, before Doug was here, as under the previous administration, is the wind contracts didn't cost the utility nothing. It cost the rate payers $135 million. So we're not going to go down that road. Uh, so that's one of the analysis that has to be done by CWLP uh, management uh, with regards to that because you have to look at the total cost of providing electricity and driving down that cost element for our rate payers. Alderman Donnell. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the comments that have been made this evening regarding proceeding with caution, uh, needless to say. However, uh, I, I, just for a point of clarification, how many other public utilities did you say your, your firm deals with? Um, in the in the energy market space, 58. 58. Uh, from an IRP perspective, we're we're you know active with, with so a handful our, right now. Is the purpose of getting the RFP on renewables for accurate data, or is it for the utility to pull the trigger, or both? I, I mean, it's a combination of things. So it's not necessarily that 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 requires the utility to pull the trigger, um, but that data is time sensitive. Um, the, the the production tax credits and the and the investment tax credits are decreasing uh, in the future, and so um, the sooner you get a project kind of started, the more you can take advantage of those. Not not CWLP, but we take advantage of the prices by extension um, that the developers are going to get those tax credits. Typically, how long would a a proposal that was submitted by a company be good for? Uh, we'll, we would we would uh, decide that in the RFP. We would dictate what that is. And so if the RFP said responses are due by March 1st and the prices must be good until, you know, July 1 what or whatever that what might be. What would be typical? Would it be three months, a year? Um, uh, I'd say three to six months. Okay. Yeah. So, typically not a year. So if, I mean, it's reasonable right. to say 
that if an RFP, RFP were issued by the utility mm -hmm. and if there were responses, uh, that we would be expected as a council to make some kind of decision mid or late next year. So the um, you know the alternative is that uh, we wait until the IRP is done, mm -hmm. um, and then release probably the same RFP. Right. You know, three or six months from now, um, and as opposed to already having the information and then starting to make the decisions. And so we're just trying to fast forward that or recommending that we fast forward that. Again, we can, we, we can wait. It's just there's an issue then of timing of, of actually developing those, those, uh, those projects. What I was getting at is there's mm -hmm. got to be uh, another public utility that you, uh, mm -hmm. that you work with or a number of them right. that have put out RFPs recently, I oh, would sure. think. Yep. And I was just you know, thinking, why couldn't we just utilize that data if it was just a data issue? We can, and that's what's in the model. All right. Um, what, uh, what we don't know is, um, so solar prices, because, um, because based on the, the actual solar factor and, um, and, and latitude and everything else, uh, weather locally and everything else, the price that we received in Dover, Delaware, um, it could be significantly different than it is in Springfield, Illinois. And so while we're using those updated prices and we have an idea that, and we know solar's getting cheaper and so on and so forth, we don't know how cheap it is here. And that's what that provides us is that, that additional layer of, of certainty. Well, I, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the caution. I appreciate us uh, looking at all alternatives. Um, however, I echo what Alderman Tylen said that uh, ultimately, we want to produce. We want to be able to present to our ratepayers that we've we've not only uh, not only have power uh, at a very reasonable price, a reliable power at a very reasonable price, but the cost that it co the, the cost that uh, in order to generate that power is as low as possible because we need to keep that as far far down. And that gets to one of the things we talked about. I'm not going to ask the question, but we did talk about last time. Uh, one of the things we'd like to see is uh, updated. We'd like to see how much it costs to produce power here locally. We've been asking that for quite a while. Right. So. Back to the renewables RFP is, and I think uh, Jamie had mentioned it is the timing of it. That uh, so it's, it's not necessarily we're buying power for you know two years from now. It, could, it it might be further down the road, but we need to lock in contracts sooner than later to take care of the tax credits. So it's basically putting a shovel in the ground that that allows us to get involved with that and, and receive those that, that benefit. We're working with those companies that we buy the power from. So it's more of a long longer term look, I think, um, once we get into it, but um, that's kind of where we're headed. So can I add just one piece of specificity to that? I'm sorry. Um, so for instance, the 30% um, uh, investment tax credit for a solar developer. They get 30% tax credit from the federal government if they develop a project. Um, they have to have a safe harbor, essentially shovel in the ground by the end of 2019 in order to get that, that tax credit. But the project doesn't have to be in service until 2023. And so when, when we talk about timing is of the essence, it really is the end of 2019 that there are some things that will impact ultimately that price. Then that, that ITC goes down to 26% in the next phase if it's after that. So it's not huge, but 4% on, on, a, on, a, on a large project is still 4%. So that, that's just to give you an idea of why, why, why that timing matters. I'm sorry. Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I have is, is so now that the wind contracts are off, that's being that's being uh, taken care of on the on the fuel adjustment charge, right? Correct. Yes. And when will they? When will our not only the when will our rate payers? Um, it's about two months behind. I mean, okay. by the time the, okay. the costs fall through. And, and, uh, do you, and Doug, one thing I would like to have from you is, uh, do we have a comparison of where we are on? Uh, on the corporate side, on on businesses, what we charge businesses compared to the you know around the area or other other. I know we have one for for residents, but I don't I don't know that I've ever seen one for businesses. Yeah, I think the business ones because um, there's so many different rates that vary, like with Ameren rates, right. um, it's very hard to do. It's convoluted, um, but uh, you know I think I've, I've mentioned that. Once the IRP is done and we have a direction of where we're going, I want to do a cost of service study for our rates because right. I want to see this. Uh, you know, they might recommend making rate adjustments to the commercial and to the residential um, as maybe any specialty rates that we have. Um, I think that's important to look at those costs and see where we need to go. All right. 
And just just a note, I, I, I'm I'm not talking about just in this RFP that we need to be careful of. And I've talked to Mr. Zirkel about it that we've got to make sure we never get in our, the city in a situation like we were in because we, I mean, we were that was a lock stock, and we were we were in some serious trouble on that. So. It goes for all contracts. We should have boilerplate that, that that's what we have to use and, you know, that's best for the city. So I think we all agree on that. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, Council. Chair, will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the December 4th, 2018 City Council meeting and approve the minutes. I move. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre council first reading of ordinances into the record of this city council meeting. Moved. Second. Sorry. Thank you. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of the city council meeting. Moved. Moved. Second. Thank you. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Can't find my, sorry about and that. the consent agenda passes. Eight voting yes, none voting no, and none voting present. Agenda numbers 2017 2017-436, 2017-489, 2018-110, 2018-285, 2018-322, 2018-395 remain tabled or in committee. Next item on the agenda is number 2018-518, an ordinance to decrease the number of class F1 liquor licenses by one for Central Point, Inc., doing business as bar none, located at 427 East Monroe, and increase the number of subclass two liquor licenses for Central Point, Inc., doing business as Jim Mill, located at 235 South Fifth Street, as amended. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-518 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Just a, just a quick Hello, thought. Senior. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just, I'm just concerned um, that there's really no separation between the two businesses but one door and, you know, who's going to be doing the policing outside of themselves. That's, that's my major concern with this. Uh, the uh, proprietor can come up. I know I was in the uh, facility just uh, Friday and they have a, it's, I think he's done some remodeling where it's just a simple door that's closed if you'd like to come up and the other one's a surface store that they'd come in and use uh, for supplies I imagine and I'm, I'm not against it but it's just a question that I have in my mind because it's so close and there's, there's really nothing there's no outside patrol that can can tell when one is closed and who if the door is locked that's just my major concern yeah, those doors remain, they're locked after 1, 1 a.m., so there's no, uh, no way for the public to access either side. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I was just stating a concern out loud. Okay. I don't have any problem with it. It's just a concern. Very good. Any other questions, Alderman Tyler? Um, as I stated before, I'm just not in favor of 3 a.m. licenses. I appreciate that you're decreasing the number of days a week on this, so I'll be voting present. I'm not providing any resistance to this passing. I'm just not going to support it. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes six vote, seven voting yes, none voting no, and two voting present. Next item on the agenda is number 2018-520, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing the execution of contract UE 19-10-53, coal hauling for a three-year term with McLeod Express LLC in an amount not to exceed $13,060,744.75 for the Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-520 on final passage. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and second. Discussion? Yes, please. Alderman Tyler? Um, I guess my one question that comes up is more for 
whoever posted the um, the RFP or it, would it be an RFP or bid? Um, competitive bid. When it was posted, um, I guess my one concern, the more that I looked this over and went back and forth and back and forth on what's going on here, is that did we have a specific formula posted in the competitive bid for how they were supposed to plan the fuel cost? Because what we've got is an issue here where one company did it by projecting futures and one company did it by saying they'd guarantee a lock-in rate. And that seems to be the only real major hang-up in the whole thing. Did we have something in there about with guidance as to how to make that part of the bid? They were, they were given a form that says for every one cent change from $3.50 of the fuel cost, well, how would your bid change? One company said it changed by three-eighths of a cent for every penny below or above, and the other company said their bid would change zero. Okay. So I have nothing. To, I know nothing about futures right. or what happened. They, they said their bid would not change if, if the price varied. So for me, re I wrestled with this back and forth because I we received an email from the one company, and the other gentleman came and presented to us last week. And I understand where both companies are coming from, but it sounds like both of them bid according to the competitive bid formula. Yes. And the way it comes down for me is my number one thing is I don't want to put the city in a position where we have a liability. Corporation counsel, is there any reason not to accept or to push back the bid that's in front of us to pass without putting, you know, I. I don't see a way, a reason compelling enough here legally to discard the bid. Well, the the department uh, has uh, reviewed the bid information, and a determination has been made as to who is the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, so consequently, there's nothing uh, that's uh, been presented so far other than it appears to be an argument over the analysis used by the department in determining the low bid. So the uh, judgment of the department has been that the lowest responsible bidder is the one that has been recommended. I would respectfully point out too that the because of the nature of the contract, uh, it has certain rights to uh, for either party to terminate the contract. So uh, effectively, uh, it's not uh, really a binding three-year contract, but either party may give actually a 30-day notice at any time. So uh, uh, keep that in the back of your mind that as a practical matter, the department has analyzed, made a recommendation, and so currently the only question is, is the council comfortable that that evaluation has been made properly? But the department, it's my understanding through the purchasing agent and so on, uh, has uh, indicated that they've recommended through the analysis that they've used to recommend what they deem to be the lowest responsible bidder. Correct. That answers my questions. Thank you. Any other discussion? Alderman McPenable. Thank you, Mayor. What we have here are two uh, local, locally, um, two bidders with local presence. And the uh, bidding difference is, is um, fairly minor, the, uh, but we've got one bidder that's guaranteed us a price and the other bidder did not. I th we can't get into any legal trouble if we start the bidding process over again. Um, we can get into legal problems if we choose one bidder over the other and there were some discrepancies that eventually get pointed out. So uh, that's the judgment of the council. We can always reject all bidders and start the bidding process over. Now, last week, we got into a discussion about, well, you know, the contract, the current contract ends December 31, but our city code gives our utility um, what we call um, emergency determination power, where our utility can go out and do a short-term contract with, without needing the approval of the city council. Um, for a short-term emergency, and so not having a 
coal hauler could be considered that. And we've done that, I think, two years ago. We did an emergency determination for the coal hauling contract. As I remember, I think we, some of the roads were shut down and we needed to um, modify the contract. And that was by emergency determination. Some of the railroad crossings were shut down, as I remember. So uh, that's why I'm going to vote no if this comes to a passage vote tonight, because I think uh, let the competitive process work itself out. And uh, the, the bids might even be um, drop because we know we've got two local competitors wanting to get a $13 million contract. So that's why I'm going to be voting no if this is, goes to passage tonight. Yeah, if you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Sam Beelman, B uh, president of Beelman Truck Company. I addressed you uh, last week. <clears throat> I've, I've got some things that I'd like to point out, and I'll make it as brief as I possibly can. Um, go ahead and uh, pass those out. Last week I focused on the coal haul bids that were given directly to CWLP. Tonight I'd like to direct your attention to the C uh, CWLP um, seemingly biased and, in my opinion, unfair evaluations that ne negatively impacted the rate payers and low, low bidders for years. Springfield residents are currently paying um, more for electricity compared to what's available on the open market. I'd like to address, <clears throat> I've got a copy of the State uh, Journal Register, and, and there's an article on that. Point of order, what's that have to do with this? <clears throat> that, the, the price that we pay for electricity has nothing to do with, with this. That there's a lot of things that are being done currently. They're not taking advantage of the best price. And I would like to show you in two I, I don't want to get into a, a you know, a accusatory situation with our with our staff. That's, mm -hmm. I don't think that's fair to our staff um, to come out and accuse them of, of being biased or whatever. I mean. Yeah, I think everybody's aware of what the State Journal Register has published. Uh, but if you'd skip to your third point or third slide or move past that. Okay, <clears throat> the 2005, I think it was in 2005, we were low on the scrubber stone bid. And we brought in a superior quality product. The material um, was actually a little bit smaller than specified. There was a flow issue or concerns at the power plant. We ran a test in there. It, it flowed through the system very well. Ironically, when our supervisor was not on site, I, uh, CWLP, claim that the material plugged up, therefore the, they, uh, they kicked the Buhlman bid out. CWLP went back to the original supplier, Central Stone, for a lower quality at a higher price. But the next slide I'd like to discuss is a letter that I sent to John Davis in 2011. Excuse me, Excuse me for a second. We're, I'll go with Turner. I think we're still in the same situation that Autumn and Hanauer had uh, complained about. We're going back to 2005, 2011. I think the issue is the contract that's before us tonight. And, and, and you will agree that I gave you a lot of latitude last week. I gave you 10 or 15 minutes to state your case. And then even after you went through your whole um, PowerPoint presentation, I also allowed you a whole lot of back and forth and give and take with CWLP management. So I think that if you have something that's new, that that relates directly to the issue of the bid in front of us, I mean, I'm more than happy to hear that, but I think that the things that you're talking about now are things that are best, that would be best I can show you to, that would be best said to the inspector general that was here earlier because you're what you're alluding to now is that there is bias on the part of CWLP and that's not something that we can talk about right now directly related to this contract. If you feel that and if you think that's an issue, I would encourage you to have a conversation with the inspector general about that. Mayor. Alderman Senor. Alderman Turner stated. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, and some of the data, I mean, you're talking about the coal contract. I can tell you, I know that stinking coal contract. Your, your numbers are flat wrong. Flat wrong. If you go by the numbers they had, the first two years, you can't accept those numbers because we couldn't buy from them. We were still but they didn't in. tell you that, did they? I'm sorry, this is out of order. 
And, and we know, now you're saying that we are the ones that are misguided based on, on some of this other stuff. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is way out of line. It's way out of line. I have, the, I have uh, got three other coal, companies. Hauling that. of coal. That's what we're discussing is the hauling of coal. For the coal? Mm -hmm. That's all I can speak about? Yes. It's mm -hmm. the ordinance okay. at hand. But I think uh, Alderwoman Turner's correct. If, I mean, some of this goes back to 2008, I think, 2011. Uh, you know, that'd be the uh, venue is taken before the Inspector General. Times have passed. We have a new uh, management of CWLP. So, you know, I have my full faith and confidence in Doug Brown as a uh, general manager of the uh, utility. So, uh, prior to his arrival, that's, uh, he's taking corrective action. Alderman Redpath. Uh, Mayor, uh, I wanted to hear from uh, Director Brown on, on a, a issue two before we vote on this, mm -hmm. so if we could. But did you want to speak to anything else uh, new with regards to pricing, why you feel yours is more competitive than the other? I think the council be open to that if there's new There is one document in here on 2018 scrubber stone bid, and I think it speaks for itself. Um, <clears throat> The city did not put in the uh, motor fuel tax. If you don't add only seven cents per gallon to their equation, we are low. Um, there's three other companies here that, that feel that uh, they did not get a fair shake here at Springfield. And uh, I believe there could have been somewhere around 40 million was uh, the high level uh, estimate. In, in 2011, I, it's my understanding CWLP failed to collect the $30,000 certificate of a deposit when Curry Ice and Coal breached the contract. Um, we checked with the city treasurer's office, and there's no record that McLeod has got the security posted. Um, therefore, we think that McLeod Express did not comply with the bid requirements, and appears that uh, they may not be complying with the contract requirements. Um, also, we think that according to the uh, 2015 bid, the, the city's paying approximately 40 cent higher fuel adjustment uh, cost right now. I think there's hundreds of thousands of dollars over the per ton price that was bid. It, this affects no one more than the rate payers, payers of the city of, of Springfield. Um, we sent a FOIA request in Wednesday on, on the 12th to get invoices for the last three years. We've not heard back from the city yet. We, we believe the city has paid significant fuel adjustments, virtually wiping out the savings that John and Doug proclaimed last week. The current price for coal hauling is 242. CWLP wants to award it to McLeod's bid at 344. Uh, John Davis made the comment last week that by January 1 they would have only 10 days of coal inventory on hand. That wouldn't, it wouldn't a, a prudent operator get a larger stockpile built up with the lower contract price. Most utilities do not go into January with, with only 10 days worth of inventory on the ground. And perhaps McLeod is not making the deliveries. I'm not, I'm not sure what happened here. Um, last week, Doug Brown mentioned a new 30 day, day out clause and quite frankly, when we were bidding the contract, we missed that this document had been changed. We consider this a bad deal for both sides, for the city and for the, the trucker. This is not a three year contract, it's a 30 day contract. A trucker cannot, a trucker can just up and leave with no penalty as long as they supply a 30 day no notice to the city. Mike Lesko made the comment last week that a new bid process could not even be completed in 30 days. Uh, what if the only other bidders made the other commitments with their equipment in the meantime, where will the city, or will the city just run out of coal? If the city was to make a 30 day notification that they wanted out of the contract because the fuel got too high as, as Doug Brown had suggested, this would drive a much higher haul price whenever uh, the commodity and the trucking prices were up. The idea that trucking companies would somehow come down on their haul rate after a fuel price increase is not realistic. Um, there was a discussion last week about a rebid. Our contention is that we have the best and the lowest long-term offer on the table. 
If you need more time for evaluation, we recommend that the city extend the existing coal hauling contract 120 days with McLeod. The existing hauling contract is very low cost to the city, so this would be the best interest for the ratepayers. If McLeod refuses to honor the current contract over the 120 day period, Bielman will honor the R2015 or the, or the 2018 bid during this, uh, this period. Our 2018 bid, by the way, is lower than our 15 bid. Over the 120 days, we'd like to have an open discussion with the city on how to, the rebid process will work. The bid specs need to be written so it's fair to the ratepayers, to the suppliers, and to the haulers. If the bid process, process does not get straightened out, you will more likely be down to one bidder on the scrubber stone, and I think there's only one qualified bidder left. Everybody else has been eliminated by CWLP. One bidder left on the coal, and perhaps one bidder on the trucking. At the end of the day, the ratepayers really have to pay the price. I thank you for the opportunity. I, I can certainly uh, answer any questions. Lost a lot of the, the meat of this. You're missing a lot of opportunities to save money, ladies and gentlemen. Any uh, questions? Alderman McMenamin. Well, Mr. Bielman, I, I agree with the other aldermen that bringing up those other contracts was a, was a bad idea, but I think your focus on the current contract is, um, uh, you've got some strong analysis there, and uh, I think you give us reasons to rebid the, uh, the coal, coal hauling, and I think uh, your proposal is reasonable under the circumstances to uh, allow the existing contract to con continue if, if the other hauler wishes it to, and if the other hauler does not wish to go beyond <coughs> December 31 on a temporary basis, then you're willing to step in, Yes, sir. is, is what you've stated. Yes, sir. Alderman Senor. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I think that would be very unfair if we have a, a, a process that, that is in place and if there's a protest that needs to be uh, made, then I think the, the contractor has a way to make that protest. And if he didn't take advantage of that, then I, I don't think this is a forum that he, we should be listening to this in. If the other contractor bid and the bid was a, a, a proper bid and it went through the, the process and our, our purchasing office uh, did all that they were supposed to do and it seems like they have, it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it would be easy for me to come if I lost a bid and present all this information, and I don't think it's very fair, and I think we would be putting ourselves in jeopardy if we allowed this process to go any further. Other woman, the censor. Any competitive bidder that comes in here and proposes a resolution that's favorable to them is highly suspect in my purview. So I understand you're upset. Um, but there is a process. It's the protest. If you think there is some shady business going on with the city, contact the inspector general. Anyone can do that. But I have to agree with Alderman Hanauer on this, that this is, a lot of this is extremely out of line. I would uh, ask John Davis on this uh, clarification. If you add only seven cents per gallon to the CWLP bid analysis, 2019, um, is Bielman the lowest bidder? I mean, based on our calculation, the seven cents at what year and at what time, you know, that's some of the issues that, uh, that he brings up there. The current price is 306 a gallon. You know, at 306 a gallon compared to Mr. Bielman's price, you know, we're saving, you know, almost, you know, 20 some thousand dollars a month today. As of January 1, we'll be saving 20 some thousand dollars a month. You know, he's projecting, he says that's seven cents, you know, based on, okay, well, if it goes up seven cents and then you have an 11% increase or a 15% increase, then maybe his numbers are right. I'm going off of what we have. What we have in front of us. That's how that was just. That's how it was analyzed, not with any ideas of where taxes may be next year, two years from now, or three years from now. I know what I have today, and that's what it's based on. The 306 price. Is that what it was? That was, last week. That was the cents. that was the price at the uh, the rack price was 306 a gallon. And then, can you speak to the 30 days of coal? I thought uh, we typically keep 30 days of coal. And well, we only have enough room to store about 100,000 tons of coal. 
you know, if we can get some barges and put them out the lake, we can store more coal. But I can only store 100,000 tons at the most of coal that, on our property. What's that equal? Well, it all depends. You know, we can burn upwards of 8,000 tons a day. So I said 10 days of coal, you know, are we at max? Probably not right today. So that's why I said 10 days of coal. If I had another, if I could put coal somewhere else, I could have more days of coal. But I don't. If you've ever been to the power plant, you know how limited that space is. Mm -hmm. So it's based on, you're basing it on an estimation of usage <laughs> that it would be 10 days worth of coal. It could be long, it much could longer. Be more. If yeah, it stays unseasonably it warm like right now, yeah. And we're not having people using the electricity for heating and other other things. But the, the key is, you know, we were said a good manager would have more coal on the ground because of the cheap price. I can't put more coal on the ground. I'm sorry. Hundred thousand tons is it. all you can get. Yeah. Any other questions or discussion? I'm going to talk to Doug Brown about one of the issues I had with the contract was the the coal uh, truck uh, tailgate banging. Um, you said that there's a built-in penalty now um, that will stop the, 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 they'd have to abide by or be fined up to a thousand dollars per incident. Correct. Yeah. So if if there's a complaint uh, as far as noise goes, um, then we would take the name and the address and then turn that over to the trucking company and. Well, for when I talked to the mayor and the corporation council today, they suggested that we have to use our uh, CWP security to help us with that. Is that correct, Mayor? Yeah, can they, uh, can't they write a ticket security? I think they can write it. Well, a it ticket. depends on when we get the complaint. A lot of times we don't get the complaints till the next day. So it's not they're going to write the driver a ticket. Um, that we'd have to turn out to into uh, either security or the power plant, somebody with a name and address, and then we'll take care of it from there. Basically put it against the invoice. Yeah, if, so if uh, Alderman Redpath or a resident so wakes up in the, the middle of the night and calls, morning calls say, hey, I, I should just for, wait till the next day because I do get them. Yeah. Well, you can call security. Okay. And then they can go out and I'm just saying there's a lot of times we do get phone calls the next day. And it's not just my ward. Alderman Turner's got the mm -hmm. same situation in her ward. They hear it just like I do. So, And and I know you guys, and i got I t I to tell you, John Davison, you had done a stellar job trying to keep that under control, but it does keep the citizens awake. It's in violation of our noise ordinance, and we got to make sure that we got that under control. And I know that this, this penalty for $1,000 per incident is going to take care of a lot of that, and we will institute it. If you don't believe me, ask Walmart how much that costs them. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? So Someone in the back. Oop. Pardon me? Guys, you have one oh, more yep. I just did a quick look, Mayor, and you asked about the seven cents. I believe what he, what the comment was was seven cents above the three fifty, which would put it at you know the the three eighths or uh, three eighths per cent over. So if the coal price, if the if, excuse me, if the if the fuel price goes to three fifty seven, then he's the low bid. But again, prices are at three oh six right now. Depends where you shop. Excuse me, John. That's not. It's not what we were talking See, about. Mayor, we're still, Mayor, we're still doing a post-analysis on something that was done and went through the process. And, you know, it's not fair to the other contractor at this point when, when we get to this point. It's, it's just, I think it's, you know, all due respect to you, sir, I understand, you know, it's a competitive bid and, and you want your bid to win. But we went through the process and, and I'm going to stand by what I, what I said. We would be putting ourselves in jeopardy if we didn't accept a contractor's bid that was put in legally and, and they followed the form. Yeah, we just want to clarify your on the pricing since it was brought up. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mark McLeod, McLeod Express owner. Um, ad address uh, 570 Country Club Meadows, Decatur. And I, you know what? I thought the bid was black and white and very clear. If the roles were reversed, you would have never heard from me. I know it was one of the closest bids I've ever been in, and I agree that fuel has been higher the last year than the last three years. The economy's been booming. Um, what, what, to me, what it really comes down to, we spent half the time looking at the fuel. If, uh, based on the, the, today's current prices, 
we would rebate you back, the city of Springfield, about $600,000. And remember, this is the highest year of the contract. Even if it went up a quarter, we would rebate you $300,000. That's significant. This is a low margin business. And the competitor would keep it and pad his margin. I don't understand what we're doing here. And I'd sure hate to think we have to bid on it again when we came in with our best foot forward. I mean, how are other people, contractors, going to look at your bidding process when you come in here with a black and white issue? And you know what? I, I would I would have never showed up. We're, we're saying if fuel goes down, we're going to rebate you back money. He's saying he's going to keep it in his pocket. That's all I got to say. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Any other questions? Alderman McMinimum. Uh, Mr. Bielman, do you have a response? <clears throat> the fuel, uh, we're taking all the risk on this, and I've never, ever given a three-year guaranteed price to anyone with the volatility of the fuel. And we believe that uh, <clears throat> we believe it can be somewhere in that range that I gave you last week. It could be up. Uh, that you could wind up, and I think you're paying two or three hundred thousand dollars more in a fuel adjustment on the contract today. If we can get that document, it would be fantastic. Going forward, I expect fuel to go up. We got the motor fuel taxes in there, which they refuse to put in it. I think it's going to be upwards around four dollars. That's my best guess. We take all the risk. You're safe. You have one price. End of story. You don't have to have to worry about it. We have all the risk. Alvin Pagenzi. Uh, I guess I really don't understand this one thing. Uh, the bid was put out for a specific amount. Uh, you declined to put in a, a fuel adjustment factor, and they gave a price with a fuel adjustment factor. So if the fuel stays low, they're going to make a lot of money for us. But if it goes up, we have no idea whether it is or it isn't. That's all conjecture. I know everybody says it's going to go up, but we really don't know. So I don't know how we can bid on what a future may bring we don't know. It's not guaranteed. We're taking the risk out of out of the equation. I understand what you're saying, <laughs> but we have to bid on specifics, and the specifics are what what the fuel price was at the time of the bid. Any other discussion? Thank you. All in favor of the ordinance, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes nine voting yes, one voting no. Chair will entertain a motion to for an ominous vote for agenda number 2018-531 through 2018-535 regarding appointments and reappointments. Move. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those <coughs> all, woman Turner, this is for the ominous vote. Okay, no on, on the on the next one. Okay. Aye. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. 2018-531, Nordance approving the appointment of Ernest A. Slotag to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. 2018-532, Nordance approving the appointment of Andre Jordan to the Lincoln Library Board of Trustees. 2018-533, Nordance approving the reappointment of Larry D. Hemingway, Sr. to the Springfield Civil Service Commission. 2018-534, an ordinance approving the reappointment of David Herman to the Springfield Civil Service Commission. 2018-535, an ordinance approving the reappointment of Carola Berenger to the Springfield Civil Service Commission. Carol, I entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-531 through 2018-535 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Discussion? Alderwoman Turner? Um, I, I'm very well acquainted with... Um, three of the four of these individuals and certainly support uh, <coughs> passage of their appointment to these commissions. However, I'm also very um, concerned about uh, diversity on all of the city's boards and commissions. So in the future, when we have um, an ordinance that's requesting appointment 
or reappointment of a commissioner, if we could also receive a list of the individuals that are currently serving on those boards or commissions, I think that would be great. Sure. Any other discussion? <coughs> Do you want them to come up? <coughs> if you would come up, uh, names I've read, and introduce yourself, we'd appreciate it, especially since you waited this long. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carola Beringer. Yes, Feels are. like old home week to me here. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'm happy to serve and uh, enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council members, mayor, treasurer, council. My name is David Herman. I'm an attorney here in Springfield. I've practiced law here for 25 years, born and raised here. Um, I think uh, Alderman McMiniman made some comments at the Committee of the Whole about me. If anyone has any uh, direction or questions of me, I'm happy to answer. I think it's a public service to both serve on this committee and be a hearing officer, and I enjoy both duties, sometimes not paid what I would like to be paid or experience the experiences I'd like to experience, but I think it's a public service. Any questions? David Herman and I spoke for 20 minutes on the phone earlier this week, and I support his uh, reappointment. Thank you. Great. Dave, thanks for doing the job you do, because I know that uh, being a hearing officer is the toughest job in, in Springfield. Thank you. So. <clears throat> Ernie Slotog, resident of Ward 8 on the west side of Springfield, uh, up for Historical Sites Commission. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you. And for the record, and Andre Jordan and uh, Larry Hemingway both uh, were at the committee as a whole. So, any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The appointments passed, 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is 2018-536, an ordinance authorizing a three-year lease with a vision for hope to provide a near site location for a lead well clinic for the city of Springfield for an amount not to exceed $107,609.67 plus $6,000 for telecommunications data costs and for a total amount not to exceed $113,609 for the Office of Human Resources. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-536 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Alderman Donnelly. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to uh, ask where the the cost of moving the facility, where's, where, the, where are those funds coming from? Director McCarty. Could you repeat your question? I didn't hear it. Where's the money coming from to pay for the move, Director? Uh, the move is actually being facilitated by Leadwell, as I understand it. The only costs that are going into the move would be the cost of some upgrades to the facility that we will split with Hope as part of the initial three-year lease. So the ordinance says not to exceed 113 and some change. How much of the city's money is involved in the move? Again, there is no city money involved in the actual move. The only money involved is wrapped up into the lease. Uh, the initial three years of the lease will include a portion for the upgrades necessary to operate a clinic, and then at the end of the three years, should we decide to stay there, the lease will drop at that point in time. So how much is it going, how much either less or more is it going to cost the city? Uh, overall, the increase in cost versus what we pay right now is about $1,800 a year. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Um, I guess the question I have is, on the original bid, I, if you go back to the original bid, and first of all, I think that the, the clinic's been, been great for our employees. I don't, I don't <coughs> doubt that. But my concern is we, we put out a bid, and it didn't include moving and, and all this other stuff. And, and I think that I'm concerned that had, <coughs> had we had some other factors involved in there, it, it totally throw, it, it it throws out that bid. I mean, you know, I'm, if we want to move, that's fine. But 
I don't know. I'm kind of uncomfortable about extending this lease or extending the, the, the contract and whatnot um, because I think that I think that you know this is a situation where um, I'm just concerned about the original bid and about you know I think we can we can save quite a bit more money in two years when we go out for bid because we'll have better metrics that we can go off of. And I hate to extend it another year. That's where I'm coming from. I think that's yeah. the next ordinance, Alderman. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, next the next ordinance. ordinance. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize, but they kind oh, of go okay. hand in hand. Yes, though, they so. do. Yes, they do. Um, the only comment I'll say on that is, and we do have representatives of the health care committee here who would like to speak about this and the purpose, but at the end of the day, the purpose of the move is in order to partner with another organization, a nonprofit, a local nonprofit, who wishes to join us in this. And in doing so, we will end up with a clinic that is much, much bigger than the one we have now, much more conducive to providing the on-site services that are being provided, and also we'll do it at a lower cost than what we're paying right now. So we'll save city taxpayers money by entering into this partnership with another organization and also provide a better environment for our employees. So it's a win-win, certainly, a situation. But again, we do have members of the health care committee who have come tonight to speak on this and would be happy to do so. What would the projected savings be? I'd ask uh, Director Cousin to come up and uh, explain his philosophy with regards to the year extension because I asked him that. I think earlier this week. Mayor, if I could ask Corporation Council a quick question. Sure. Would it be appropriate to make an omnibus vote for the two ordinances for discussion so that we can discuss it as a whole, even though there's a motion on the floor for passage for the first ordinance by itself? If it, it's the pleasure of the Council, but I would like to maybe this would help Alderman Hanauer. There is remaining in the provision of the Leadwell contract is six months out at any time. So uh, for the city, or actually for Leadwell, so it, it also provides under the Leadwell agreement the ability to relocate at the city's discretion. So there are already, even with the one-year extension, uh, the city still retains the right, as does Leadwell, to uh, rethink you know, the uh, uh, program. So that protection is in there, and it's one that's, uh, as you pointed out earlier in another contract, uh, the uh, that's a benefit to the city because as you get more uh, information, it may be appropriate to seek another RFP. Right. So okay. there is a six-month. Thank you for provision. that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I will go ahead and make the motion okay. for omnibus discussion for ordinance 2018, 536 and 537. Second. Second. The second for omnibus discussion on 2018, 536-2018-537. Any second. discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Now we're covered. The next item on the agenda, I'm going to read it though, is uh, agenda number 2018-537, an ordinance authorizing addendum two to the Center for Health and Wellness Healthcare Service Agreement with HSHS Medical Group, Inc., lead well to extend the contract length and move to a new location for insured members of the health plan effective March 1st, 2017 through February 28th, 2022 for, okay. So if you'd answer that question with regards to uh, extending the contract a year. When, when uh, Hope approached us, they asked for a three-year contract. So that would give them an opportunity um, to really see how the clinic operations gonna, is going to work for them. We wanted, when we started, we did a four-year. Um, so this, they're asking just for that extension so they get a three-year period. That way our lease will expire with Leadwell and with Hope at the same time. But you want to talk about the effort and oh, cost sure. savings, and um, it, it, you know when we when we look at all the things that are involved with that um, over the three-year period of time, we stand to save over a hundred thousand dollars because Hope will be picking up ten percent of the cost that we're currently paying. That third year is also predicated on us. We're having a sixty-hour week. We're only at this point at forty hours. We've been at forty hours since we started the original ordinance. We anticipated going to sixty hours. In year three and four, we have not yet done that. We've also uh, are us utilizing the Horace Mann Clinic, which has uh, uh, helped increase our utilization. Our employees can also use the Meyer Clinic on the weekends. So um, we stand to get more utilization and greater cost the more the more employees that use the, the services. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Cousin, I, I think the the committee and 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 your office have done tremendous amount of work on this and, and have brought forward 
something I believe that you believe is in the best interest of the city. We have data that shows we save money. The only problem I have with it is the fact that we would be extending the contract with Leadwell a year without putting it out for RFP because it was so contentious when it first, when, this, when they first came forward, there were other entities. One argued that they didn't get a chance. One argued that they had a better deal. And we ultimately went with uh, this group with the understanding that we were going to put it out per the original contract, put it out for RFP again. And uh, I guess what I don't understand is why is it so critical to extend it a year? And, and why I ask that question is we're going to put it out, if we did pass the ordinance, we're gonna put it out for a bid a year later for RFP, and we, they, we don't know who is going to be chosen. Correct. Why does it make such a big difference? The, the advantage, if, if you know, like I said, just it's just a timing thing. I hope it originally approached us with the three-year term. Um, they, when we work with the committee, the Joint Labor Management Healthcare Committee, the committee as a whole, um, we addressed this, this this concept with them. It also is a good fit for our high deductible health plan. So the committee was in support of it. Hope approached us. The committee was in favor of it, and we thought it was a good deal for the city. Well, but what I'm getting at is if Hope, if Hope is good, wants to work with the city of Springfield, and we have our discretion to pick whatever vendor we want to, to, do, to do what Leadwell does now, why does it matter if it's two years or three years? That hasn't been demonstrated. Because uh, at the end of the two-year period, we would have a, either the same provider or a different one. We still have the partnership with Hope. I don't understand what would be different. That is just the term that they that they approached us with that we were working with. Okay. There was there was no particular marriage to that. That we that, that's what way they approached, and we you know it was a it was a good fit for us that allowed us to have all those things expire at the same and, time. And, and Mr. Cousin, I, I appreciate hope willingness to want want to work with the city of Springfield and mm -hmm. help us save money. I want to be very clear there, but I guess the question the question is to hope. What happens if we just say no? It's going to be two years, and we're going to put it out for RFP, and we either have the same provider after that or a different one. How does that change things? If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Uh, Clint Paul, uh, President C CEO of Hope, uh, 2207 Lake Crest Drive, Springfield. Um, as far as the question about the two years, um, we are amenable to a two-year uh, lease if that's what the uh, council and uh, you guys decide uh, on not extending that. Our contract with Leadwell is a three-year. We just figured to line everything up would be better, but um, we would be amenable to two years if, um, if that's what the council decides. We would do a two-year lease at this point in time. Thank you. Is, now, I guess, Mayor, if I can, my, my follow-up question is, and I don't know if it's to OBM, to the HR, or to someone like uh, Mr. Allwood, who's here, is there, what happens cost-wise if, if, if it is changed to two years? Yeah, I'd ask. I think what you're looking at, I, under, I understand where you guys are looking. I'm sorry. I'm Mike Allwood, uh, IBW member on the Labor Management Committee long-term. Um, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I know you guys deal with a tremendous number of contracts. Healthcare is a completely different animal. If the employees don't utilize it, then there's no savings. It was a giant waste of money. You know, I understand that there are other RFP people out there. When we did the initial RFP, there are only three providers that I'm aware of in town that do this. Or that, actually, there's only one provider in town that does what we do. There's another provider that offered to do it, Springfield Clinic, kind of just off the cuff, did a really good job of trying to put something together. We didn't feel that it worked for us. And then the other provider actually does a program where the people just use their existing facilities for some kind of a discount type of situation, which is very different from what we're doing, okay? When we came into this, we did the four-year contract because we know in order for any of this to work, we have to educate the employees, we have to get them invested, we have to bring them on board. We've looked at other models, we've done a tremendous amount of research, we've been looking at this for a decade now, knowing that with the escalating healthcare costs, really mitigating the catastrophic claims is the only way to keep our costs low long term. 
uh, employee wellness clinic like this really helps you take control of that and combine it all into one area where you can consolidate, get your employees comfortable with it, where they have one-on-one -on -one interaction. It, it, and our numbers show that it's working far better than we expected. From analysis, we also know that if you can bring a partner in and mitigate those fixed costs, then you can expand the program, thereby enveloping more of your employees, mitigating more of your catastrophic costs long term. Well, when we bring a partner in, I, I would like to extend them the courtesy of letting them do the three-year contract with a little bit of stability as well. You know, it, we're, you can talk to lead well, they'll, they'll tell you that we were the best opening they've ever had. They've never seen a group respond the way that our employees did. Will hopes employees buy into it like ours? I don't know. It may take theirs a little longer to, to gain traction and for it to work for them. I'd want to enter them into an agreement, move out to their facility, spend the cost to modify it, and then tell them, okay, you guys have to really not only do good, but you have to do better than we did when we're the best people that they've ever had try a program like this. So when you bring partners on, you want to extend the courtesy to them to get their program up and rolling. This isn't like a coal contract where you're like, okay, we're not going to use these guys this day, we're going to use these guys tomorrow. It may take you 18 months or 24 months to get your employees to buy into the new program. Or they may never buy into the new program. And then you turn around and go back the other direction. You walk away from the wellness. You walk away from your success. Uh, it, it has just got a huge value. And I assure you that when we do the other value of adding this contract and getting it longer, we're not going to issue the same RFP that we issued three years ago or two years ago. Two years ago, we weren't sure what was available. We weren't sure what would work for us. So we just kind of threw out a big generic RFP saying, hey, give us your ideas. We want to see what's out there and what works. Now we know what works for us. So when we, when we put out another RFP, we're going to write it a little more specific so it includes those things that we know will work for us and exclude those things that we feel will not be a benefit or increase our costs. Alderman Hanauer? Uh, and, and I can appreciate that. And, and you know, this is, this is a first that for the city. And so we, I can understand being broad, but, but that's the point, I think, the, the concern of, of many of us about um, extending the contract. I, I think that because we can target things better, that we might be able to reduce the cost of that contract. Um, it's, it's worth at least a shot, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But I think that because we know what, what we need where before we didn't, you know, we can, we can pin things down. I just, I, I just don't, I'm concerned about extending it and not potentially taking, we, we, may, ha we may have some significant savings. You know, uh, based on what we want, because they know they don't have to care for us, you know, X or Y or, you know, whatever it, 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 the, the, it, whatever it is. Uh, I just think that from the city standpoint, I think now we can now we can zero down because we got metrics we can use where we didn't have before. I just really think that, that it, it is a, a situation where it, it would benefit the city to go out for bid at the regular time at which, you know, I mean, obviously we could cancel the contract and say go out for bid now and, and then we'll move. But I don't think that's fair to the original bidder. I think that, but I don't think it's fair. Um, I, th I, I think we just ought to keep it at the three-year contract and not extend it. That's just, that's my thought. Because we know what we, you know, we can pin it down. I think we can save. I guess my question would be, uh, Based on your experience, what's the pricing at now compared to if you went to the market right now? I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? I mean, in, if we put it out for bid industry, two years from now, is it better to lock in for that extra year based on the pricing we have now? Or if, it, if not, then we should put it back out after two years. Um, I can't answer to what it's going to be, but I can answer to the fact that I've sat through countless RFPs with countless vendors in the healthcare area, and the metrics are very hard to hit. And out of all the contracts we've awarded, 
I can now say we've had two vendors who have met or exceeded their ROI or savings promises to us in the 20 years I've been doing this. Everyone else promises a lot and then it doesn't, doesn't come through. So when you get a vendor partner who's actually meeting those requirements, who's actually willing, Leadwell not only is meeting and beating the savings that we were promised when we started, but they're willing to modify their procedures, they're willing to change programs inside there at no additional cost to us. They're constantly morphing and growing with the committee's wishes and the wellness program, and we're capturing more and more of those people with the comorbidity factors that are the future catastrophic claims, and we're sweeping them into cardiovascular programs and dialysis programs and diabetes programs. Uh, if you follow health insurance, you got about 5% of the people that generate 95% of your costs. If through a program like this, we can get 2.5% of those people out of the 5% swept over and we can mitigate some or all of those catastrophic claims, you're talking about huge savings five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and being able to maintain an actual budgetable health care plan. The problem is, and I'm willing, I understand the RFP process, you have to do it, but besides savings, when we take into account an RFP for healthcare, one of our deciding factors is disruption. If you're going to disrupt all of your employees and they're not going to use their plan, same with the PBM, if retirees can't get their blood pressure medicine because there's no pharmacy there, the pharmacy out in Utah may be very cheap, but we can't select it if nobody can get their medication. The wellness program is no different. We can't select one, we can't say, okay, we're gonna save, maybe save another 15 or $20,000 if we choose this provider. But we're gonna take four years of effort and growth and trust and sweep it to the side and tell all of our employees we're starting over at square one with new people. How many of you people like to just change doctors randomly, you know? It's kind of the same thing. You have to get the employees invested. We still, we still follow the RFP process, absolutely. We go out, we look at the costs, and I can tell you, and I think our, our repu reputation says, we take way very heavily on the cost point, and we're doing all we can to keep it low. But the next most scrutinized point is patient disruption and utilization. If we can't get the care to the people, it doesn't matter what it costs, okay? So, and like I said, we're looking at hope now. We would like to see another partner come on in the future. We wanna build a reputation as being a good partner, which is why, and that's really the only reason we're trying to give them the same opportunity that we had to build their program, stretch these costs over three years, which is their contract with Leadwell, and make it all work. I honestly don't think that extra 12 months that any savings we would get from an RFP would be appreciable. I, I honestly think it, it would not hurt the city. And an extra year in this existing program is going to generate significant savings even above what we're already realizing. So the soft savings in this really outweigh the numbers you're seeing on the paper by far. Alderman McMinima. Mr. All Allwood, uh, thank you for your explanations. I think you've really explained things well, and uh, I support both ordinances. I th think we've got a program that's working, and it's going to work even better going forward. My concerns last week had to do with location, and in talking with you and with um, Director McCarty, I understand that we actually have two sites now for Leadwell. We've got um, the south site, which will go even further south, but we have right in the middle of downtown, we've got the Bank of Springfield building, which is a lead well site at the uh, corner of Jeff um, Madison and uh, 9th Street. And um, that location is doing very well. I understand it's got about 25% head count of, of patients now. And we even have a, an emergency weekend site, uh, which is one of the emergency rooms, as I understand it. Uh, at, at the uh, Meyer Clinic. At the Meyer Clinic. So, um, Mayor, my concerns have gone away that I expressed last week based on uh, the location concerns. Very good. Any other discussion? 
Alderman Redpath. I, I concur with Alderman Hanauer's uh, uh, assessment of this thing, and I just think we always benefit when we go out for an RFP. There was a lot of contention when we put this contract out. Some uh, people felt like they were being slighted and, and left out of the process. I think that it's important for us not to extend this contract another year, and then we go out for an RFP and put everything back on the table so we can see what we got. I guess I'll uh, respond to that because I was in the room when we offered it to different providers and they didn't have a plan in place. Actually, I approached 186 at the time, asked if they'd be interested. We were yet a year ahead of its time. And so thanks to the good efforts of the committee and everybody working together, that's how we've been able to get this point and save, I don't know even how much money, but I'm sure Director McCarty will let us know. But that's what it's all about, how we, uh, I think really the key issue is how do we provide the best possible manner health care to our employees. And I don't want to lose that in sight. And I'm not sure if we uh, gain anything. It sounds like we have a potential to gain by that extra year. I'm not sure what the loss will be if we put it out for bid. We could go the other direction with higher costs. And that's what I'm not sure about is when we locked in the pricing of, uh, you know, back when it was entered into, compare that to today's pricing, have they gone up or down? I mean, I, I don't know if you've even looked at that. Because that will give you a measure of that. The original contract, it did provide for, you know, increased cost as hours went up and the cost to the providers, so the, but all of that was encompassed within the original ordinance. Mm -hmm. so, Alderman Tynan, do you have a question before the next speaker? I was going to ask Mr. Allwood. <clears throat> I had a, I had some brief conversations with some employees who called me concerned about this particular or these two ordinances, and one brought up, and I guess I don't know if you or Mr. Coos would be the correct person to lead this toward, but um, somebody said that anything affecting the health care isn't that part of their collective bargaining, and isn't that the point of having the health care committee? Mm -hmm. So could you? expand on that a little bit just so that the people, I know that they're either watching or going to be paying attention to this, but it will answer their question. Correct. The, all issues dealing with the, the health plan for the city of Springfield are vetted through the collective bargaining process at the Joint Labor Management Health Care Committee. We work out what we can live with based against the management, the mayor's side, on what is cost affordable, what, what we can come to agreements on. And once the committee gets a majority or most of the time unanimous decision on our recommendations, we then send it forward to the mayor. He vets it through legal and through his own concerns for the retirees and the non-union side of the people affected by this program. And then in the end, it comes to you, you folks here in the horseshoe to make the ultimate decision based on the needs of the taxpayers of Springfield versus the employees. So yes, it is a collectively bargained portion of our health care plan, and this is what was agreed to between the management side with the labor side. We, we agreed to do this as part of our health plan through the, the Joint Labor Management Committee. It was collectively bargained. So, and we agreed to it and then we send it to the mayor for his approval. If he doesn't like it, we can always go back and negotiate something else, but I, I feel that in this case, we, we've done the right thing. Okay, and then my follow-up would be to the gentleman here from Hope. Um, you said earlier that you were amenable to, that if it was the will of the council, that the two years could work for you. Um, will that affect, I mean, just be honest, that's what we want, is would that affect the relationship going forward? Uh, no, but <clears throat> what it would affect is if uh, after the two years and you guys do go out to RFP and get a new provider um, and change providers and we're stuck, not stuck, but we still have our three-year or our extra year on our lead well, that would then probably shut our clinic down that third year. We would have to opt out. Uh, because we're not large enough to go on our own with lead well on our own clinic. So if you pr selected a different provider and went out, I'm sure it would be somewhere else. Potentially they have facility, so that could negatively affect our uh, employees okay. in our and program. So. Director McCarty, you were trying to explain uh -huh. earlier about how the 
building improvements and the leases that it's only you said something about it only being an actual realized increase of eighteen hundred dollars per year could you ex expound on that a little bit because i'm not sure that i completely understood sure what so, you were trying to explain sure if you run the numbers we're currently paying somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty four thousand dollars a year for our current lease the existing location on south sixth street and if you look at the new numbers with the proposed hope amount, including the amortization of the improvement costs, it comes out to, with our 90%, about 1800 bucks, give or take more than what we're paying right now on an annual basis. So that's the differential. And the benefit of the move is that it's going to be more space, which means that they would be able to bring in more doctors, which means that they would be able to see patients faster. Well, the space is a lot more conducive. If you've been down to our clinic on South 6th Street, you'll know, and I know at least uh, one alderman has been there and realizes just how small that clinic is. There's only a few rooms where patients can, can wait to be seen or can be seen, and the waiting lobby is extremely small. In fact, it's so small that one of the big concerns is you walk in and you're reporting that you're there, and typically they're asking you what you're there for while well, everybody in the room can hear it. The reason for the new space is not only to enter into a partnership with, with Hope, but also to vastly improve the amount of space that we have. The number of, of rooms available for exams is at least doubled, maybe more than that. I forget the number. And certainly It'll the- will be six. be six. Okay, so the waiting, and then the waiting area, there's actually two areas where you can wait. There is a uh, much bigger- waiting area within the clinic itself, lobby area. But there's also the area just outside the clinic in the main Hope entrance where there's also a cafe and some other amenities there. So certainly the space itself is much, much more conducive to our employees uh, and their comfort than what we have right now. And then the final reason is the clinic is large enough to accommodate yet another partner or two partners, whereas that isn't possible at our current location. So if we were to take on another partner or two, which is being discussed, conversations have been had, then we will save the taxpayers of the city even more money because we'll have more individuals or more organizations who will help share in the cost of the clinic. And that leads me to my final question. You, you set it up a little too well. Um, if we do bring in the next person next year, does that mean that we're going to be asked to extend it again to give them the three years? Mm -hmm. Or if, the, you know, it, it's just, are you setting up a set of dominoes here where it's going to keep getting extended because we keep adding partners? And I think that is one of the big key points to a lot of the contention here. I think that the council's made it very clear tonight that there wouldn't be another extension should this one pass. And I don't I would not assume that we would even have that discussion with the committee. We've got members of the health care committee here from the union side. We have members of the health care committee here from the management side. And I think everybody hears the council loud and clear that should this pass, that there will be no more extensions and we will be doing an RFP. And I think we're comfortable with that. Thank you. All the woman Turner, then uh, we'll go to the podium. Um, I think my question or, or concern is one that was raised by, just raised by Audubon Thailand. Um, it, are we are we putting hope in a, in a in a tenuous situation by by moving there and extend and working on extending this? Because what I just heard the representative from Hope say is that if we either bring on new partners or opt out of this contract with them, that their clinic would close. So why would we put? A provider in that situation. I mean, what what I heard him say was that if there's any change in the partnership or location, then that would force their clinic to close. So why would we set that type of of a scenario up? That's why we're asking for the one year extension but because their facility. By moving to their facility, we can accommodate both groups. And no, I, I understand that, but what he... The three-year contract keeps them from having that tenuous end at the end of the three-year. Both of us, our contracts with Lead will expire, and we can go our separate ways. Excuse me, but I, I understand all of that. We, we've said that many times over the last couple of days, but that's not what I heard the representative from Hope say, was that any change in what in the current situation would cause their clinic to close. So so I guess my concern is the same as Alderman Thailand's is that if we decide after 
the year to then go out for an RFP and there's a change, are we going to are we going to have the representative from Hope come and say you're forcing us to close our clinic? If you if you change, if we're still in a contract with uh, Leadwell and you change to another provider, I assume those can't be done at the same location. So that would make my assumption that the city would have to move to a new on-site clinic, which would be at a different location. And that at that point in time, we would have to decide as an organization, what are we going to do? Are we going to invoke our termination clause with Leadwall, try to still partner with the city, move somewhere else? Those are decisions that have been made. We could look at that, but we, you know, but, we're, but didn't you just I'm trying say, to guess at what would happen at But that didn't point you just say we would have to... I thought I heard without, you say without we the city, have to we close. cannot have this program. Okay, that, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. So we don't have enough employees. We only have 600. Right. So, so that's my point. Is that he? What I'm hearing, the representative from Hope say that no matter what we do tonight, if at any point we decide to terminate our relationship with them, which would mean go out for an RFP, and if someone else, if if someone else was chosen at the provider then they would have to close their clinic. So I'm just, to me, that's setting up a, a bad situation for them as well as for us because I don't want, at some point, we are going to have to go out for an RFP. We can't just continue to. We're, we're not to sure we would continue. We can't continue. just continue to pass this along. So what I'm saying is I, when that time comes, and if it's an adverse decision, I don't want hope to then come back and say, we don't have a clinic because Springfield decided to not partner with us. And I guess uh, in Hope's contract, is that the same as ours, where you have that six-month uh, It's less than that, I believe, at this point. They, they have the same provision. Same provision. Same provision. So it's the same provision. Okay. If we, you, can we go to Gene first, or, yeah. or do you want to? Let him talk. If you'd state your name. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. I'm Gene Mitchell. I'm a staff representative with AFSCME Council 31. I represent three locals that work for the city of Springfield. That's local 337, 3417, and local 3738, which cover CWLP, public works, your zoning commissions. I mean, I represent over 250 employees who you're currently talking about. And I just wanted to come up here, Mr. Mayor, and first, thank you for your sentiment, because up until you spoke, the only thing I heard up here was how much money we could potentially save, nothing guaranteed, um, without con due consideration to whether or not our employees actually like their health insurance. And the reason why I'm here is because I've talked to many of your employees, and you're not going to believe this. They haven't talked to you very much, and they've told me that they like their health insurance. Uh, so one of the considerations that you should consider, aside from just the downright uh, dollar amount that you could potentially save, is how much money it will cost you if your employees don't like their health insurance, can't keep their doctor, and have to use more sick time because they have to travel farther to get their prescriptions, et cetera. Not everything is about a plus and subtraction that you can find on Excel spreadsheet. It's also about the quality of care that you provide to your employees, which in turn will attract the quality of employees you hope to hire at the city of Springfield. So again, I, I definitely understand the, the horseshoe sentiment about the need for an RFP, and there should always be a process for continuing to try to get the best price possible. But at the same time, we should also be serving the best public servants that we have in the state of Illinois. Thank you. Alderman Hanahill? Yeah, it, and I appreciate his comments. And, and Turn your mic. But Mic's on. Yeah, push up. Didn't see the red it's on again. It's on go. Thank you. They finally got that working, by the way. That's kind of a nice touch. Um, is there any penalty for us um, leaving the um, current location uh, early, or if we would go to the new location and exercise the six-month clause? Is there a penalty there? I guess my my biggest question would be: Is there a penalty for leaving? The current location that we're talking about on 6th Street and moving, because I would think that they would have had some sort of a, the landlord would have some sort of a. The space is actually, uh, I don't know if it's owned or leased by HSHS, and they're not penalizing us for the move. All right. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? 
Alderman Donley? Mayor. Yeah, sorry for speaking again, Mayor, but I appreciate That's the right. opportunity. I, I just want to be clear, Mr. Allwood, I, you know, I've, I've worked with the committee in many capacities over my life, and I, and I appreciate all the hard work, and I know you're sincere, and I appreciate you uh, taking the uh, initiative and giving me a call. I enjoyed our conversation. I, I always learn I always learn more when I speak with you about this process. I don't even think we would, and, and the quality of health care for our employees is, of course, of the utmost importance. I don't think we would even had five minutes worth of discussion if we wouldn't have, <coughs> based upon the initial, uh, the initial RFP, we weren't extending the RFP. Uh, I think the need is clear that we need more space. I think you've demonstrated that very well. The savings uh, on the books has been tremendous. That's been well received. Employees are utilizing the system. That's something we always wondered if they would, and it's good to see that they are. But what what troubles me is, and I, I guess to get to get to the heart of my question is, if we were to pass these two ordinances and give the one year extension. How do we ensure that the city is in the driver's seat? In other words, we don't, no disrespect, but if Hope decides, well, we want to stay with Leadwell uh, because we believe they're the best in the world, uh, and then we haven't, the city puts out an RFP and chooses someone else, or the committee recommends someone else and the council goes along with it, uh, how do we, how do we uh, make sure that, how do we ensure that the city is still in the driver's seat? And, and we don't disrupt hope. We don't disrupt our employees because nobody wants to do that. I, I think uh, anybody that would insinuate that is being disingenuous. I, I think that that's a, a well-made point, and that's kind of why we're pushing this for the end of their contract. At the end of the three year, it would be no no different if you guys don't extend the contract and we don't partner with them and we stay at the 6th Street facility and try to continue making that work through the remainder of our contract, and we go out for an RFP and somebody comes in and blows us away, the move would be no different at that point. We Instead of moving from South 6th Street to whatever new provider's facility is available, we will be leaving hope and we'll be giving them an opportunity to have built up, and if it doesn't look like we're going to remain playing partners, it'll give them an opportunity to look for an additional partner, or they will be at the end of their contract and they will have the opportunity. Uh, I, I've spoke with these guys a little bit. I know some of the people that work on their program. I think we'll have a very good working relationship. If we didn't think they were going to be a good working partner, I can assure you that the healthcare committee would never have even entertained it. We met these people, we checked out their facility, we talked to them, we got an idea of what their expectations were before we even considered pursuing this avenue. And I know I don't have any way to guarantee anything, but if, if you trust my experience on the committee and what I've done to this point and the millions and millions of dollars that the committee's decision have saved for the city, trust me on this. And let us give this a chance. That one year really is not going to affect that much on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the hard number savings side. I'm confident of that. This program is driving the majority of its savings on the soft end anyway, which is why you guys are seeing the renewal rates so far below national averages that people are wondering how we're doing it, quite honestly. So. Uh, I'm just asking you, you know, tr trust the committee's experience here. Give us a chance to make this work. Give us a chance to bring a plan partner on and be a good plan partner without putting them in a trick bag right off the bat on a two-year lease with a three-year contract. Um, I, I believe I've said everything I can. If you have any more questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. And I'd be happy to talk to any of you individually at any time. You can reach out to me day or night. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, go out and take the ordinances out of order and vote on 2018-537 first before we vote on 2018-536. That is a motion. Is there a second? Okay. We move and second to take 2018-537 uh, out of order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. So we're going to vote on uh, item of agenda number 2018-537, an ordinance authorizing addendum 2 to the Center for Health and Wellness Healthcare Service Agreement with HSHS Medical Group, Inc., lead well to extend the contract length and move to a new location for insured members of the health plan effective March 1st, 2017 through February 28th, 
2022. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-537 on final passage. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The motion fails, four voting yes, six voting no. So do we need to vote on the other one? Um, we may need to, uh, if, uh, if the think so. uh, 536 is for the three year lease, um, this, the not extending it a year does not mean there cannot be a, right. a working together. You can amend it, right? Uh, so if the council the and amending. The other one was for, the one we voted on was for the contract. That was for years. the extension. The extension. Yes. That's the one that should have been amended if they want to go for a lower year. Well, it, it would go currently then through uh, February 28th of 2021. So in order to conform the lease to that, it would be a two-year instead of a three-year. And that would allow the process uh, basically for HOPE to uh, partner for the remaining two-year period of the existing uh, contract with Leadwell. I had understood uh, a HOPE representative to indicate that they were agreeable to a two-year lease. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so if, uh, if the parties wish to proceed, then it would just simply be an amendment instead of a three-year lease, a two-year lease. If, uh, uh, if we want to proceed with that this evening, then they, it would need to be amended in order to reflect that. I would offer that amendment. So the, the first the first order of business would be a motion to adopt 2018-536. Uh, then a motion to amend. Motion to amend to uh, from three year to two year. Please. Second. <coughs> the, it would be proper to make a, a motion to adopt the entire ordinance, then bring the amendment. I make a motion we adopt the ordinance Five. for final passage. That's 2018-536. I've read it in the record. Okay, very right. good. Second. Then it would be appropriate to make an amendment. And I make a mo um, motion we amend to go from three-year lease to two. Second. Uh, and then vote on, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, are we in discussion? Yes, sir. Um, Director McCarty wanted me to bring the Director of Hope back up. There's a question that he needs to ask. My question is the lease that we had agreed to originally at three years had the amortization for the bill out costs over three years. Do we need to amend the amount as well to spread those bill out costs over just two years? Uh, no, we're amenable to doing it over, no, doing it over three, would... but only having a two year lease. So we're taking the risk of the third year. What I was gonna say is so what, what, uh, what I'm The release rate will stay the same. We would just simply keep the lease rate the same, but yes. instead of three years, it would be for two years. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So there's no cost changes for no, it would, Springfield? No, it, it would reduce the amount shown of the 113000 by one-third. That's, that's to pay for the entire, yes. if I'm understanding, yes. uh, that, okay. Because there's an annual, there's a monthly, and there's an annual payment, so it would be a two-year period reflecting those same monthly and annual cost. Correct. Okay. So everything's uh, reduced by a third. Yes, sir. Mayor, real, real quick. Clint, I just want to say you do a great job out there, too. I think it's you kind of fly under the radar try. for what you do, but I want to publicly tell you that you do a great job. Thank you, and we're excited to partner with the city. Any other uh, questions on the amendment? Um, All those in favor? Do we need on. to put the actual number in? If you would and like you to, it? if if you would like to, just by a quick calculation, it uh, appears to be uh, seventy-six thousand one hundred and eighteen dollars. Um, actually, I think we need to separate the two numbers out. I think it, uh, Director McCarty, if you can double check me, it looks like the first number should be seventy-one thousand. $739.78 plus $4,000 for a total of $75,739.78. Uh, 
pretty close to that. Okay. So if we said not to exceed seventy six thousand, we'd be within the ballpark. If you even went up a little bit more, to, it's not to exceed. So if we're off a little bit. So if we call it, I I would like to offer a friendly amendment to make it not to exceed seventy two thousand plus four thousand for a total of not to exceed seventy six thousand. Is that covered, Director McCarty? That's covered. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Both say nay. Motion passes. So on the ordinance as amended, any discussion? Or amended twice, I guess. Any discussion? So uh, just so we're clear, we're voting on a two-year, uh, or keeping our contract the same, but moving locations for the amount not to exceed $76,000. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Grand total. Any discussion on that? Does that have, does this excuse me? Does this have to include uh, the moving? Does it have to have wording in it, including the moving to the new address? That's part of it. Is that part of this already? Because it doesn't it doesn't specify that in, in this five thirty six. It just says the near site location. It doesn't name the site. So do we need to name the site in the ordinance that they're moving to? I think the ordinance uh, in the uh, reference to the lease uh, uh, properly identifies the location. Okay. Um, and it's uh, my understanding, based on the um, uh, party's uh, discussion here today, that this would be authorizing a two-year lease with hope and utilizing the Leadwell uh, clinic process at this location and in partnership with uh, uh, hope uh, yeah, at that location. Could this location specify by being the new building that they're moving to? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the ordinance as amended twice? Vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is number 2018-565, an ordinance to decrease the number of Class D liquor licenses by one due to closure. Don't we still have to vote on <coughs> the other, 536? We did. We did. Oh, vote okay. on 536. That was 536. It's late, Chris. No, it's it's, it's, so we're not recalling. I thought 537 still failed, then 536. So we're not recalling 537 at all. Okay. okay. We don't need to. Got it. <coughs> yep. Due to the closure of business of Vili's Inc. doing business as Mangia, 518 the East Adams for emergency pass. Chair, Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-565 on emergency passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes. Ten voting yes, none voting no, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is number 2018-566, an ordinance to increase the number of Class D liquor licenses by one for Mangia Benet, LLC, doing business as Mangia, or Mangia Benet, located at 518 East Adams Street for emergency passage. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-566 on emergency passage. So moved. Second. They moved and second. Any discussion? This question, Mayor, uh, has the legal name changed? Is that what's prompting this? The, there's, uh, there's actually a new uh, owner and a new entity, and uh, the old license was under the old owner, old company name. This is a new owner and a new LLC. That's what I thought. Thanks a lot. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. The ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is number 2018-567, an ordinance authorizing the execution of an agreement with Board of Trustees of Southern Illinois University to provide a grant research partner required by a grant from the Sorry. Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority for the Focus Deterrence Grant number 416504 for an amount not to exceed $52,988 beginning November 15, 2018 through June 12, 2019 for the Springfield Police Department for emergency passage. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2018-567 on emergency passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? 
All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. The ordinance passes 11 voting yes, none voting no. Is there any unfinished business to come before the council? I do have a few items. One is uh, save the date for the ribbon cutting of the SMTD Transfer Center moving from Capitol Avenue to uh, Knight Street, uh, just north of the county building, and that's at 10 a.m. on Friday. And then this uh, DSI in partnership with uh, the Art Association, the City of Springfield participated with a letter of support, received the Lovett Grant for the YMC or Y Block for uh, music, so we'll be hearing music on the block this summer. And then uh, fireman applications are due tomorrow. You can go online at springfield.il.us to uh, put in your application. Is there any new business coming before the council? I did have one question on the, the, the uh, winning the, the grant. Mm -hmm. I, it was, I did have someone contact me and ask me that if something did happen and we move forward with the Y block with a proposal or if someone came in and purchased it, do we have the ability to move the venue? After winning, since we won the grant, if something happens where that spot is not available because of the land being developed, are we allowed to move the venue? We would have to uh, probably check on that. I think the plaza with the Jackson Street corridor that was in play, that could be a possibility, but the intent was to activate space and it was specific to that block. Chris, you got a buyer? Uh, I, could only, I could only wish, but I did have someone email me asking that if something happened, thinking forward, if the Y block was purchased or developed, if the development went forward, what happens to this grant? Mm -hmm. So it was just, I, since right. you brought it up, I wanted to bring that out in the open so that we could at least look into it, that if something does move forward, are we allowed to move the venue? Right. Alderman Senor. Uh, and this is for Director Mahoney. Um, Director, I've had some complaints about the condition of 11th Street since the sewers have been repaired. Is there any uh, plan to, to repave the whole street between uh, South Grand and Cook? Well, the, so, yeah, well, the, the complete, the final repaving will be in the spring because at this point there's not much we can do. We'll do the cold patch and, and best we can. Actually, they should have finished painting it. It should be done. And the bear gates, if they're not all off there, they should be shortly. Yeah, the bear gates are all off. It's just a condition of where they... Yeah, that's the condition that's going to be at least through the winter. So okay. try to do the best if there's any issues to address them. But the problem is at this point, obviously, the asphalt plants are closed, so there's right. not much we can do. Then in the spring, we're going to resurface it. We'll put the binder down, resurface. There'll be some more ADA ramp work and some sidewalk curb work will be done as well. Does that include 12th Street also? Yes, it gives all that area. All right, thank you. Alderman Hanover. <coughs> Thanks, Mayor. I guess, um, first of all, I guess congratulations on getting a sign. But could you kind of go over what, how this whole thing, or maybe Scott come up and go over how this whole thing went on? Um, we I know we all got an email about the same time that it went out to press, and and then the rest of the weekend, every time anywhere I went went, we were getting kind of getting hammered on it. Um, I, I mean, you know, the other thing is, you know, I I'd, I heard your interview, which you did a very good job, but um, if there's a if there's a plan that we I don't know if anybody up here knows about a plan for Route 66. If there is, I'd like to have something in my email tomorrow so we can at least answer to that when when we have constituents ask us, you know, because um, I, I think the lack of communication here was just terrible. I, I, I'll be honest with you. And, and, you know, we went the whole weekend, and I don't know how other people were, but I did get, you know, people... Well, for, for, first and foremost, I've only been on the job a few months. <laughs> there is a plan. Okay, we just weren't ready to disclose that plan or get that ready until 2019. We are going to bring that forward. There's been a plan for some time. Matter of fact, the plan dates back 20 years to a 2020 plan in Karen Acera era, Nikki Stratton, Kim Rosendahl. They were looking towards a corridor on a 2020 plan. Actually, I think that plan might be in the mayor's office somewhere. Um, we've been talking about this corridor for some time. Um, I know the Fulgenzies, uh, Jeff and Annette Fulgenzi have been very active in a plan for the corridor. So there is a plan. When I came on board just a few months ago, um, I went to a Route 66 um, conference down in Carlinville. I talked to Bill Kelly at Scenic Byways. 
I really believe with the 100 year anniversary coming up for the uh, in 2026 for the for Route 66 that we need to be jumping on board. We're the original marketers of Route 66. We've been passed by through the years, and we need to up our game heading into that centennial. Also, there's a national effort to make Route 66 a historic trail. There's going to be millions of dollars in grants available. Springfield will have an opportunity, and we will go to be the national headquarters for Route 66. So, you know, there is an effort. Now, the timing was awful, for sure, absolutely. Had we rather have this plan in place and, and, and let the city and obviously the council know about this plan and then three years down the road have the sign come up? Absolutely, because it would have fit in real nicely. But the owner decided to, to put the sign up for auction and we had about 24 hours to do something. We weren't trying to be secret about it. We just, we had some discussions. I had discussions with the mayor. I had discussions with Bill Kelly. I had discussions with my tourism manager. Um, we had discussions across the board that said, who's bidding on this? And there was nobody locally that was gonna step up and, and bid on this. No organization, no company. These signs were heading out of town. They were gonna to head to, to California, Chicago, or Pontiac. Pontiac was bidding on it. So we had to make a decision. There was no secrecy. We just didn't want to, for the bids to continue to increase if they knew that the CVB, the city of Springfield, was bidding on it. We were trying to keep it on the down low to keep the bidding down. We didn't go privately to the owner and ask for a deal. This was already out there. And this fits nicely into the corridor, something that we're going to market for tourism down the road. As far as notification, because it came up so quick, I do believe that the council received an email from me at 538 in the morning on Saturday morning completely explaining what was what I just did in greater detail. So I don't know what other communication you want at that time besides the fact that we were trying to keep it low. Whether the communication as far as the press release came out to the council and when it came out to the public, I believe that is obviously not from my office. Um, and that's a timing issue that I think, you know, works out with the city. But um, as far as an explanation, I thought I'd provide that explanation on Saturday morning. Well, just, it, just so you know, we all got hammered pretty good. Yep. And I can tell you that the uh, taxpayers are not happy. And they and that the fact that uh, we raised the hotel motel tax last year, and then we turn around and spend twenty-two thousand dollars on a sign. They don't understand that. They don't get that. That doesn't make sense to them. Well, you, it, the, the hotel tax that you raised didn't go to the CVB. The hotel tax raised went to it doesn't matter to the cemetery, the and then it went to a hundred thousand dollars. That, that the tax. has just vanished. I, don't, I haven't seen the hundred thousand dollars. So, and and this isn't this is this is a hotel tax. This is the visitors paying for this. This isn't the taxpayers, this is not one dime. Unless you're staying all night, unless Springfield residents are, are booking rooms at hotels, they're not, it's not a dime out of their pocket. It's just all visitors and you reinvest so that the visitors will come back and they'll still see your the city again it's because still you the have. taxpayers' money of the city of Springfield though, Scott. Okay. It's still their money, okay? They don't like it. They didn't like it at all. And you but know the what? visitors are paying. Let's make that clear. It doesn't the matter who's paying for it. It still belongs to the city of Springfield. The city of Springfield, that's their money. And they didn't like it. Because every one of us aldermen took a beating on it. I guarantee you. Mayor, one question. Alderman Anna. I, I guess my frustration, Scott, is, you know, we brought things up to, to give money to, for in my case, it was the golf outing. And I had the Hotel Motel Association, everybody going crazy over it because we're spending their money. And this is for an event. And I don't see any of them here. So it just seems like you guys can spend your money how you want, but when we want to target something, it's not good. And I, I have a problem with that. I, I, I think that where, where's the Hotel Motel Association when, when you know, because, you know, the, I just... I, I think just it's because when we they, did it, they when believe we did it for the other events that, that, that were last year, people people weren't happy about the hotel motel, you know, what whatnot. And you weren't you were part of that group way back when you you guys came in and I I distinct did you ever hear a heads in bet? And that's well, exactly what we're doing, Alderman. This is what this quarter is going to bring in. 
I don't think anyone understands the impact that Route 66 has, especially on an international basis. I mean, point to me one expert that said this was a bad call. One tourism expert that said this is a bad call. I have plenty of armchair quarterbacks that say this is a bad call, but give me one expert. One. I don't, I don't know, okay. so I can't. Alderman McMinimum. Scott, welcome to the horseshoe. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. You're bringing new energy to your position. Um, you had to make a quick decision in consultation with others. Uh, you did what was in the best interest of Springfield and the area. And uh, so now, having heard your explanation, we as leaders have to go out and explain that to our exactly. constituents because, yeah, we are getting beat up on this, but we have a good explanation to give, and let's, let's give it. I also want to compliment you, Scott, for getting out and around. I know you're up in Athens, Illinois, Saturday morning, um, and I saw you paying attention to the tribute to John Eden of the Long Nine Museum up there, who um, devoted his life to that museum, and that the Long Nine Museum is, you know, uh, has to do with the fact that Abraham Lincoln, uh, as a young legislator in the in the year that he became associated with the law firm in Springfield, was able to moved the capital of Illinois from Vandalia to Springfield. A young legislator, Abraham Lincoln, did that. And you were up there early Saturday morning, and everyone was talking about the Sunrise Cafe, at least Tim Butler and Representative and some others. But you were there, and uh, so you're dedicated. That's what I'm trying to say. You're dedicated to trying to do the right thing and to um, spur a lot of interest in tourism and the Route 66, the Centennial in 2026. So let's get behind our new tourism director and help him out here. If you could explain Thank the you. call you received from Iowa. Yeah, so I received an email from uh, Cindy Coleman uh, from Dubuque, Iowa on Sunday morning, and it says, um, I host a 30-minute public affairs radio program, KDTH Radio in Dubuque. It said, I see the city of Springfield recently was the winning bidder for the Route 66 sign. Very cool. As my show is called Voices of the Tri-States, I thought it would be great to bring you one, of, one or one of your staff uh, via phone to talk about the importance of the sign. Route 66, and possibly Springfield tourism in general, as, as the city would be a great weekend trip, three and a half hours away. We just created a new market. We're going on the air for 30 minutes on Friday. Uh, we likely just created a new market in Dubuque. We, what's funny is we are targeting Iowa in 2019. Uh, we're going all the way to Des Moines, Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, and Dubuque, Quad City area as a new market for us, along with Chicago and Indianapolis. You'll hear about more of that later, but um, certainly nice to see you. We will be on the air on Friday for half an hour. And I equate this a lot to the Salvation Army move, because oh. a lot of, I'm going to bring it up, because a lot of people didn't understand that. And really what you do is hear the voices of the public, and how can you move in that direction? And that's turned out to be more of a positive, but let's lay out the Route 66 path because what you have is the closing of Shays. When Shays closed, nobody knew where that memorabilia went. A lot of it went out to motorheads. And so we just annexed that in. This council took the initiative to move in the city, which was the right move. And what you're trying to do is lay the path for people to do something other than Lincoln. We talk about that all the time. Route 66 gives us that opportunity. And so what we're trying to do is move them along the corridor. You have Fulgenzi's on the north end. They bought the gas station, the uh, oldest uh, gas station on Route 66. But how do you connect that? How do you follow it along the way? This sign will help do that. And we have proven evidence we did it just this summer with the uh, AIDS hat hunt for Lincoln. A lot of sites weren't being visited like they should be, so we came up with that simple marketing program where you had to go get a sticker and visit these other sites. And so that's what they did, and those other sites saw a very drastic increase of their visitorship. We can do the same thing with this Route 66 by uh, tapping into whether it's signs or uh, experiences out to Motorheads, the Fulgenzies, to a sign company, but we need to lay that path, but we best be prepared for 2026 because it's going to be here before we know it. And how do we best embrace the corridor? And what it comes down to is why the, the plans has sat on a shelf that's coming off the shelf due to the efforts of others is because of the lack of resources. But as that 100th anniversary gets closer, there's going to be additional resources coming forward, so we need to be in our best position 
to embrace it and really capitalize on that opportunity because it only comes around once every 100 years and we plan on doing it to the best of our ability so we have visitors or residents experiencing that on a day-to-day -day basis or hopefully multiple day and then go visit Lincoln as well. So that's what the whole impetus is. How do we get them to stay longer? And this is a piece of that connectivity. And if you don't have authentic memorabilia on that, on that corridor, if you just have replica stuff, the, the Route 66 roadies will call you out and they'll tell the world. So we need uh, items that are real. And those in Springfield, this is to Springfield. This isn't coming from somewhere else. This isn't a franchise. This is Sunrise Donuts, 1947, Springfield. And believe me, Alderman, Since you I read blogs all the time. I understand. I, I get beat up blogs, as yeah. bad, if not worse, than anybody. So, uh, you know, that's part of it. But this is a right move to take. Listen, it, it, it wasn't about the sign. It, right. it was about the communication. Right. And, and that's what got everybody buried on this thing. If, we, if, you, if there's a plan laid out, lay it out. Put it out here now, and we don't worry about it down the road. That's the problem. And we that's were, the problem we we're going into. It's a lot of issue. different issues here, Scott. It's not just you. It's in other areas, and the mayor knows this. Mm -hmm. We've got to start communicating. Well, we what it, really what we it can, comes we down to. We can transport that to, to our taxpayers, the people we represent. Really what it comes down to is coordination. And uh, when he talks about a plan, you have a lot of different entities doing their own thing. So what we need to do is tie it all together. And how do you bring the people to the table? I asked Scott to get all the uh, people around the table that have impacted. Mm -hmm. Representative Butler is uh, doing a, uh, I think he designated the Bicentennial Committee. Uh, well, or the Centennial did, yeah. Committee, right? Yep. And so uh, we're moving uh, Bill Kelly, uh, Pulgenzies, whoever's involved in that planning, we are going to meet around the table, coordinate all that effort, and present the plan early 2019. So one more question. Sure. There's, there's like five different corridors for Route 66 through Springfield. Some say it goes down Dirksen. Some say it comes up Peoria Road. Some say it goes up 6th Street. Where's the, where's the original? I mean, I know they over the years, the dates have three moved times. that have. Route 66. Yeah. Am I right? They have, yeah. There's different version of it. So everybody in the city can say, no, it ran down my block. Well, yeah, but that 9th Street corridor is the main corridor to come in on Route 66. Okay. It's the well, main we're going to embrace corridor. it all. Well, I know that. I'm just saying. <laughs> the sign's coming out of Ward 6. It should stay in Ward 6. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> just not in the alley. <laughs> just not in an alley. All of it's Yeah, Yo, Mayor, you, you, you opened the door, so I'm going to go through it. Uh, okay. I think that's one of the big issues, Scott. It, it, I don't think anybody has a problem with us purchasing the sign, but the way the sign was purchased, the mayor alluded to uh, the Salvation Army, very bad communication. In this, in this sense, three years later, three and a half years later, same deal, bad communication. So I don't think anybody's pointing at you, but they're pointing at the product and the way we get the product. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to fathom when we have to answer uh, questions from our constituents. And they say, why are you spending 22000 I know where the money came from. I know it's not quote unquote city taxpayer money, but in the end it is taxpayer money because of the grant that, that's passed through that's supposed to be for uh, visit, Convention and Visitors Bureau, but we still have to answer these questions every day. You all don't get them. You buy the sign, you put it away, you, you, you give it to ACE, let them uh, restore it and put it in their warehouse until we get ready to use it, but it's still, we, we need, somewhere along the lines, we have to be told of what's going on so we can answer to our constituents who put us here. And if we don't do that, then they're not going to put us back because we're not giving them the proper information at the proper time, and it's here we are, what, six days, five days later after the sign was purchased, and now we're talking about it publicly, and it, it just puts us in a bad spot. Yeah, and I tried to talk about it publicly right away. I got on the radio right away and, and, and talked about it. You so. did, but we couldn't because yeah. we didn't have all the information to get, give to our constituents. And just for the record as well, I got hammered as well, so uh, for sure. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Share the pain. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any other new business come before the council? Question. Yeah, yeah. Alderwoman Turner. It's not about the sign or Route 66. <laughs> <laughs> the um, Abe's Head Hunt, that was a fantastic promotion. Was that a one time deal or is it still, go it's still going on? Yeah, we'll continue that. Yep, we're yeah. planning to continue that in 2019. We got a lot of product for one, so we didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So, we still have a lot of product, so we'll continue that. Uh, through 2019, history comes alive. Uh, we're just putting that together as well. So yeah, it was a fantastic. I, did, um, I had grandkids from out of town that came and we did it, and we wouldn't go to number eight. So now we can go to number eight. So maybe we'll do it again. I was gonna. I was looking for Julie. I was gonna say, thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, all the time. 
Um, under new business, I would like to remind the public and the press that we have committee this Thursday, December 20th, instead of next week on Christmas Day. And then our next council will be Thursday, January 4th, January 3rd, my mistake, instead of having it on New Year's Day. So just so that the public is aware that the, the dates are moved, the committee will be this Thursday, the 20th, and then in two weeks we'll meet for City Council on Thursday the 3rd. I knew you would have one. I got to make sure that people know what's going on. All of them, McMinimum. Mr. Mayor, speaking of meetings, uh, you indicated last week that the uh, Ward 6 ballot objection meeting might be rescheduled. Has, there, has a date been set for that? Uh, has a hearing date oh, been set right. for that? That is uh, tomorrow is the hearing for to hear the uh, testimony at what time is 2.30? At 2.30. And then Friday is at 1.30. And that's for the board to uh, make a decision. Thank you. And uh, new business mayor. Yes. Uh, this year's Boy City Tournament, it will be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the 16th, 17th, and 18th of January instead of the regular Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Thank you. Because, well, because that tournament's been happening there for like a thousand years, but the convention center booked something on that Saturday. Saturday. They can go back to the armory. <laughs> <laughs> My brother happens, still holds a record at the armory. <laughs> so we do have uh, any other new business? We do have uh, several people signed up. Daryl Harrell. I went to sleep, I'm sorry. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and your administration. Subject is illiteracy. The United States Bureau of Sitzers, George Byrne, Lewis Armner, in 1937 defines as illiterate any person 10 years who is not able to read and write in either in English or in, in, or in any other language. Medium years of school completed by age, age sex, and color 1940 and 1958, 7 through 22, persons were regarded as illiterate who could not read and write. Wendy Grinswell stated in 2016, in order to assess whether it was or not, we need to look at the evidence. 16.4% of Negroes as being illiterate at age seven, not everyone could read. September the 20th, 2018, literacy is a key skill and a key measure of a population educated, while only 12% of the people in the world could read and write. Springfield, Illinois' population 2018 estimated at 114,868 persons, according to the most recent United States Census. As of 2013, the city's population was estimated to have increased to 117,006 persons with just over 211,700 residents living in the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area, which includes Sagamon County and adjacent Menard County. Age and sex, persons under five years, 6.1%. Persons under 18 years, 22.2%. Persons under 65 and over, 16.1%. Race and Hispanic origins, white alone is 73.2%. Black or African American alone is 19.9%. Hispanics or Latinos, 2.6%. White, non-Hispanic or Latinos, 71.6%. Living in the same household one year ago, 2013 through 2017, 81.3%. Income and poverty, Medium household income in 2013 through 2017 was $51,789. Persons living in poverty is 20.3%. Mr. Mayor, not to bore you or your administration, with 117,006 people living in Springfield, Illinois, 20.3% live in poverty. Now, factor that with those who are considered illiterate angry, mental health, under the influence of substance abuse and living at the warming center. 
showering at the Washington Street Mission, and eating at the St. John Bread Line. Conclusion. Dear Harold is asking approval from the City Council as of November the 1st, 2018, for $30 a day. $30 a day at times 365 days comes to be $10,950. Uh, time divided by 12 months is $912.50 a month. Divided by two weeks is $456.25. The reason for these First responder at the Washington Street Mission, first responder at the St. John Bread Line, and first responder at the, the Springfield Warming Center. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Jane McBride. Ann Lowe. Logue, 1244 North Bingle, Springfield, Illinois. Here's a chart on the carbon sequestration issue. And on the back are tips on how we can handle individually and as a community approaches to climate change. If I ate a piece of chocolate cake, pretty large every day, I think it would start to impact on my weight. Pretty soon my joints would start to give out and I had a good chance of developing diabetes. I am a living system. This, the earth is a living system and we need to treat it as such. We heavily support beef production in this country. Cows, although a sacred part of our diet, has an enormous amount of methane being put in the air in the gas that passes through their burps and their passing of gas. Carbon dioxide usually gets the blame for global warming, but methane is about five times more powerful when it comes to trapping heat in the planet. A way we can do our part is by substituting beef with poultry, pork, fish, and plants for our protein. Tom Brady is a stellar athlete. Maybe not so much this year, but he uh, dropped beef a long time ago and he's doing just fine. Let's see, okay. We have many advantages in the fight against global warming, but time is not one of them. Instead of idly debating what countries are to blame or the precise timeline of global warming, we need to deal with the central facts rising temperatures, shrinking fresh water supplies in our aquifers, lakes, and rivers, unpredictable weather patterns that impact crops, tornado frequency, and we just had one in Taylorville in wintertime, and hurricane intensity. It is important to remember when resources are scarce, things get ugly, and by avoiding forceful prompt action, we are looking at some very nasty struggles amongst us, Eve, here in Springfield, in our future. According to Catherine O'Reilly, associate professor at ISU in geology, climate change is warming many lakes faster than it's warming the oceans and the air, and that refers to our lakes here. This heat accelerates evaporation, conspiring with human mismanagement to intensify water shortages, pollution, and loss of habitat. But while the fingerprints of climate change are everywhere, they don't look the same in every lake. Of all the challenges lakes face in a warming world, the starkest examples are enclosed drainage basins where waters flow into lakes, but don't exit. We stand warmed by serious, incredible scientists across the world that time is short and the dangers are great. The question is whether we and our government representatives have the courage to face it. We have a population of seven billion people and counting. Of course, we have an impact on this beautiful, complex system we call planet Earth. It is ludicrous to imagine that we don't. I have a visual aid here. 
guys are probably tired of me talking about trees, but I'm gonna bring it up anyway. This is a carbon sequestration plant. And you're gonna hear about plants of different kinds, but this plant is available now and it is the most affordable form of removing carbon from our atmosphere. Not only that, it puts oxygen in. Currently, we don't have any ordinances that I'm aware of in our budget for ensuring that we don't have a net loss of tree canopy and we don't have a commitment to increase our tree canopy. I urge the council to commit to protecting this vital resource in curbing global warming and protecting our local water supply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Andy Knox is left. Is he, oh, anybody else wish to address council? Would like to come up, please? State your name and address. We'd appreciate it. James Johnson, Springfield, Illinois, Ward 2, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm going to be quick because it's been a long meeting, very interesting meeting, and I wrote notes, so I'm going to stick to the page. Uh, but this energy authority, very good, very good, along the lines of what I was been saying all along. So it's my end of the year speech, my Christmas stocking stuffers for you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Now, for some of y'all, it's going to be stockings full of coal, no pun intended. But... Uh, I didn't think you liked coal. <laughs> I don't. That's why I said it. <laughs> so let's get started with the ribbon cutting. I'm going to start with thank you. Uh, as far as for the solar farm, we're headed in the right directions there. That's what we've been asked for. That's what we want. Um, even the Girl Scouts have enough insight to say we need this move in the right direction. So thanks to the Girl Scouts that came out, spoke very well. Uh, we need them to keep educating our adults along this line. Uh, one thing about the solar farm, well, let me stay on track. Mayor, partnership. You spoke about partnerships at that river cutting. And uh, partnership requires working together, communicating, being transparent, knowing what's going on. I haven't been to some meetings, but I don't know how many people knew what was going on on that solar farm. Didn't even know it was going up out west until the day before. You know, so that's one of my issues I would have with that. Uh, hopefully, now that we have one on the, out, on the west side, we can get our next one on the east side somewhere because we're all about solar for all. And I will be pushing for that and for our community uh, to move in that direction because even this thing said, it, one thing I didn't agree about what was in here is uh, the, the decline, the, the decline of the load is going to be rapid than what they think. So we do need to move fast on clean air because I'm all about uh, uh, clean air, clean water, and, and, and the health of our, our, our elderly and our kids. You know, so it, 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 a whole lot of discussion that 13 million about this coal and all of that. See, if we had renewable energies, we wouldn't have this issue with this coal and, and, and the way it leaves our community over there in Ward 2 and Ward 3 and Ward 1. You know, there's a lot of coal dust going around, floating around. There's a lot of trains that go through our communities that's having an effect on our health. You know, we got a lot of issues, a lot of diseases, you know, uh, uh, that can't be explained. You know, um, asthma, you know, while our kids are sick, there's a lot of mental illness, there's obesity, there's a lot of issues. And I can't explain it all, but I'm sure there's some studies going on, and I, I, I'm going to be searching and looking for information to tie it all in, but we need to move away from it. Uh, along with the, the, the solar farm, the company, GRNE Solar, now, I don't know the bidding process with CWLP, and I don't know how all this goes. And I don't know how much you guys know. But we need to stay on top of the bidding process and find out what. Uh, because this GRNE company, it has a link back to Springfield. So I'm not going to talk about it right now, but the Alderman, 
dig around, ask around, find out the link. If you don't know the link, I'll come back next year and I'll start speaking on it. Because the conversation about being transparent and everybody communicating, there's been a lack of it. And it just didn't start with this administration and this CWLP crew. But man, there's a lot of stuff that go on that you guys either know about and ignore or don't know about. So that's that's my, uh, one big issue. Um, we talk about uh, local first. We need to get local companies. If we're going to move forward with building solar farms, we want local first. We don't need to go all the way to Chicago to get a company to do solar farms around here. That's all I'm going to say on that for this. Next year, we'll get a little more deep into it. Public hearings are needed. Now, I know you guys know everything because you guys are some smart aldermen. You know, you guys are very educated, and I know, Mr. Donlin, you know everything. But <laughs> we do need some of these people to. Sitting next to him. Yeah, well, Hannah, you're just even smarter. But we do need some people that come, you know, and sit and ask questions and bring up issues. Uh, because some of these people know a little more than what we do know. So uh, even a dead clock is right twice a day. You get that on your way home. Now, <coughs> let me stay on point. CWLP, in my opinion, let's just be real. They ain't being truthful. There's some things, some, there's some fishy stuff going on. Something <laughs> don't smell right. You know the old saying, if it look like a duck and it quack like a duck, <laughs> it probably is a duck. Well, I've been around here a long time, even before Mr. Tylen came along. And uh, this has always been an issue. And let us not forget our past. I think that was said earlier. The explosion that happened out there. Let's be real. The truth wasn't said about that, and it still ain't came out. And what's even sadder is the person behind it is still there working. That's just one. How about the nooses that were out there? <clears throat> huh. That person still out there working unless they ain't retired. But I know somebody that had a real close connection on this administration sitting right here. So now, this year, Back in May, they started doing some water samplings, then had to do a resampling. See, this is the kind of stuff that I want to talk about at the, at the hearings that we asked for, as far as with CWLP. You know, they had a resampling in, on, Jan, on July 9th, and all of this is on their webpage somewhere. There's a lot of reading, so I ain't got all the facts, but I got enough to come in and bring it to your attention. So arsenic levels are a little way too high at well RW3. <laughs> so there's a lot of sampling going on. And for you ones who don't know about all these different stuff in our water, that's why I harp and complain about our water. What's going on out there with this coal and this ash and all of this. I drink bottled water. I stay healthy. I work out. Don't let this coat fool you in this sweater. I do work out underneath. So they're not being honest. And for this man who was complaining about these contracts, even though he was out of order at the time he was doing it, man, it, 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 raises, it raises my ears of what's really going on because some just don't seem right with CWLP because there's, there's, there's stuff that never gets back to us. There's quite a few incidents that I don't know if you guys ever hear about. Mr. Johnson. So, hold on, let me, let me finish. Oh, Just real quick, respect. I got two more lines. Yeah, my five minutes of look up. So, in next year, they're gonna be, in January, next month, they're gonna be coming asking for a whole lot of money, you know, and I still wonder how much money did we spend last year on outages alone? So they're going to come, and we're going to have brothers here, and they're going to want a whole lot of money. But here, and we're going, and in so many months, we're going to have some new faces on this horseshoe. So some of this is going to have to be repeated. But let me tell you this. 
Don't let them blow cold dust up your butt. CWLP stands for corrupt with lying people. Yeah, that's you got going a question? Too far. That's, Come really, on. I, no, that's it for me. Anybody else wish to address the council? Well, I wish to respond to a few things that you had to say about the solar bidding process. We did have an internal meeting about it after it was awarded to GRNE, and we are aware of the Springfield connection. Okay, so, very good. So you, you weren't doing I, I your homework on that one. I said I don't know if you know. Yeah, we know, because okay. he lowest, came here. Lowest responsible bid, so. Yes. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. Alderman Hanauer. You got a question too. for me, Hannah? Well, That's fine, too. Well, I'll, I'll just say this. In, in the gentleman's, uh, pre before the, the, the every person, every group that he listed, every group that he listed were people that did not get bids. Okay. So, I mean, that every, if you look back through, through his, his list, every, every complaint that he had were from people that did not get bids, did not win bids. We have a bid, if they can't fill out their bids correctly or they're too high, that's what happens. I mean, I, I, we, we try to do it as fairly as possible, and, and if, you, if he wants to go off the bid and not do things the way we want him to, then... You face the consequences, James. I mean, I agree. Hey, you know, I'm not even arguing with it. I, I stayed away from that, but I'm just saying that you know we need to be more transparent and more more communication with not just this horseshoe, but with the community. You know, I think Chuck said it. You know, you know, community is pissed off about some stuff. You know, people don't like their taxes being raised, and you know, we spend money. You just were having a conversation about money on a sign. Yeah, people are mad. Alderman Tyler? And I have to say, I, for one, am getting tired of people drinking the Foresight Kool-Aid. <laughs> Pan hours dead on. Their little thing where they were going to save us all this money, those first two years on there, we were already under a legal contract and could not go to them even if we wanted to. And that's where most of their savings were. So people who keep going back to that Foresight pitcher and pouring themselves a glass need to read what happened. That's the whole purpose of the IRP, so we can, uh, this council's done some great actions. Uh, we can't speak about previous councils, but uh, yeah, we did implement the utilities meeting. You can argue if it's a public process or not, but we do let you speak. That's part of it. And we've provided tons of information, ward plan meetings, 40 of them. We've had other uh, forums outside of that. So uh, we presented a lot of information. But you always can throw out the communications card. You can always throw out the transparency card because there's always room for improvement. That's how it is. So we appreciate the back and forth, and we will move forward together. Any other? I think we have to talk about the special council meeting. So what motion do we need to make for? Can we do it Thursday? <laughs> we need to do it now. Once we have everybody here, we need to do it now. We have to have a special city council. Right. Why? Why? It's for the uh, CO2 capture ordinance. When is that special city council going to be? Doug, if you want to speak to that, is that, uh, we talked about it uh, when they presented, you of I presented. We couldn't be prepared for that tonight. Our, our dance cards are a little full. Huh? <laughs> I know, I was thinking, we couldn't have done that tonight. Uh, um, or the committee is whole by, by Thursday. And that's what I'm thinking. The, uh, basically, the U of I has asked us to provide a letter at, by the end of the year. Um, so that's what their, their time frame is. Okay, so do we have an ordinance in front of us? Because we're looking at a 48-hour window for yep. Thursday. We have a resolution on first reading. So it's on the first reading already. So right. if we have a special city council session for 5.30 or 5.15 on Thursday, then Keep we're any longer, it'll be 24 hours. We, we don't have the requirement for the 48 hours notice. Right. Because of this. So, I mean. Well, you were right. He just said we don't have the requirement for 48 hour notice. I thought because so we're we still do in it the middle of an active, active Monday. city council session, we're still at 5.30. Monday's new Christmas Eve. Is it? I guess we won't do it Monday. Right, no. Because, Friday. isn't it, aren't we under the same clock restrictions as like the state house is? And I, there's a couple of you guys who have done more work at the state house than I have, but I thought we're still we're still at 5:30 on the clock right now because we haven't adjourned. 
No, that was back in the day when they stopped the clock and kept going for two days. <laughs> The Senate did that. Yeah. Yeah. Just just to add something, we're, we're going to reach out to them tomorrow morning to see if they would give us to like the first week in January. Okay. I mean, we do meet January fourth, so correct. Or third, uh, third, 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 yeah. third, third, third. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna reach out to see if they would I keep allow us. There's 31 days in another December. week. That's what it is. And I'll report back to the Corporation Council tomorrow morning on that. Uh, but is everybody in town Friday? Um, Thinking Friday. lunch hour? <laughs> no idea. We could just do it after our uh, meeting. On Friday at, uh, mm -hmm. what, after the hearings, mm -hmm. about 2.30 or something. No. <laughs> 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 Sounds like a veto. I have my work holiday party. I'm not missing Okay, that. we'll get back to you. Oh, boy, would you be fun. <laughs> we'll shoot for the 27th or <laughs> January, one or the other. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Anything else? I thought we executive, executive session, session this evening. Thursday. Can we do the executive session Thursday? Yeah. yeah. Is there a motion for adjournment? Do we have executive session women. We, we can do it on Thursday. Thursday. It's fine. Is there a second? Nothing urgent. Second. Thursday is All favor say aye. Aye. Close the nay. We're adjourned. Oh, good golly, Miss Molly.